Yeah, um, welcome uh, to everybody. Very good to see so many here. It's, uh, uh, I would uh, say that we start the conference and uh, Jakob, please. Okay, um, well, um, as Ulrich uh, just said, um, I would like to welcome you. We all would like to welcome you to, to this conference and I'm going to um, say a few words by way of opening the conference and then uh, Ulrich and Janneke will introduce the different speakers. Um, so, as you all know, um, unfortunately we can't meet as we had planned at the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters and as you also know, the reason is the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, our plan was to arrange the conference at the Academy in early May this year. Since that proved impossible because of the pandemic, we decided to postpone it, hoping that in November, at least, we would be able to meet the way we are used to. Now, that didn't happen either, so we are glad that we can arrange the conference digitally and we are very grateful to all of you, to all our speakers, for agreeing to contribute in this way. This kind of commitment is a strong expression of your solidarity with us as colleagues and conference organisers, and we are most thankful to all of you. When I say we, I refer to three teachers and researchers in the University of Oslo. Uh, Janneke Korsa teaches comparative literature, Ulrike Spring teaches history, and I'm associated with English literature. Uh, we believe that uh, with a view to the topic of travel, travel literature, travel writing, the fact that the organizers hail from different disciplines is a resource. We also hope that this kind of interdisciplinarity will prove helpful as the three of us, that is Janneke, Ulrik and me, will co-edit the book that is based on and made possible by the conference. In this book, the different papers today and tomorrow that will be given today and tomorrow will form different chapters and we'll write an introduction. Now, if interdisciplinarity is a defining feature of the conference, it is surely also a, a characteristic trait when it comes to travel literature, travel writing as a genre. The topics addressed at the conference range from early travel accounts to contemporary travel writing. They also include discussions of photography, ethnography, film and media. Highlighting this interdisciplinarity and this blend of different genres and media, we understand the concept of travel literature inclusively, that is including and thus discussing not just travels undertaken by the authors who write about them, but also fictional travel accounts. Importantly, we also want to discuss travel narratives that combine elements of these two variants of travel writing. Partly because travel writing is such a large and diverse field, we wanted to delimit it thus giving the conference an edge and a sharper focus. Thus, we decided to focus on Nordic travels, travels from the Nordic countries to other countries and continents, travels uh, from the Nordic countries, travels to the Nordic countries, and travels within the Nordic countries or within one of them. Now, as I said already, the speakers will be briefly introduced by Janneke and Ulrike. 
Before asking Janneke to introduce our first speaker, I want to thank the institutions and individuals who have made it possible to arrange the conference. First of all, it's important to stress that an additional reason for focusing on Nordic travels is our sincere wish to contribute to the research project um, um, University of Oslo Nordic. We want to thank UIO Nordic and its director Tore Rem for strongly supporting the conference both by agreeing that the topic is uh, important and relevant and by supporting it financially. Second, we are most grateful to the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters for their firm approval of the project and their financial support. In particular, we want to thank the president of the Academy, Hans Peter Graver, and the Secretary General, Eystein Hov, for their enthusiastic response to the idea and for their wise advice. Ellen Mortensen, who is Professor of Comparative Literature at the University of Bergen and the leader of the Literaturvitenskap group in the Academy, has kindly agreed to make the conference an integral part of the group's activities in 2020. We are very grateful to Ellen for her support and her willingness to contribute in this way. Ellen is also a speaker at the conference. It's also important to mention that the conference is financially supported by the Yara Foundation. And finally, we are extremely grateful to the staff of the Academy, especially Gro Havelin. Their support has proved invaluable and they've shown a remarkable ability to find workable solutions under difficult and changing conditions that have made it unusually difficult to plan this particular conference. It is a thought-provoking paradox, an aspect, you could say perhaps, of the conference, that while the pandemic has made planning difficult, it has made the topic of travel even more relevant than it was a year ago. Both the concept of travel and the practice of travel and traveling will change as a result of the pandemic. Additionally, in ways we can't yet clearly see, different forms of travel will probably become linked to and necessitated by accelerating climate changes. One aspect of this complex change is that while people in the Nordic countries may travel less or want to travel less, those in other regions of the world may have to travel more or have to travel because they can no longer live and work where they used to. Thus, the ethical aspect of travel will become more pronounced and more significant. Now, concluding this short introduction, I want to reiterate that you are all heartily welcome to the conference and I now ask Janneke to introduce our first speaker. Please. Thank you, Jakob, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I think um, that was all for the practicality. So I'm now moving on to introducing our first speaker, which is Ulrike Spring. And she is a historian here at the University of Oslo, and of course, one of the organizers here at the, of the conference. And her academic interests are specifically within the fields of travel cultures, polar history, history of science, museum history and exhibition practices, with a geographical focus on the Arctic, Northern Norway and also the Habsburg monarchy. And she has been leading the Transforming Author Museums project that was financed by the Norwegian um, Council of Norway, Research Council of Norway, and it was finished last year. And she has um, published extensively on topics relevant to this conference, but I just want to mention two. Her very recent article, Cruise Tourists in Spitsbergen Around 1900, Between Observation and Transformation, which was published this year, and also her book, Passagiere des Isis on the Austro-Hungarian North Pole Expedition, which was published, uh, authored together with Johan Szymanski and published in 2015. So please, Ulrike, the digital floor is yours. Thank you very much, Janneke. 
for this uh, kind introduction. And what you can see here, this is a typical souvenir from the north around 1900. And as this picture on the front implies, this was a map, a Reisekart, used on one of the many steamship journeys along the Norwegian coast, which became very popular from the 1870s onwards. And many ships had the North Cape as the final destination, but from the early 1890s, several continued on to Spitsbergen. The ship companies were mostly based in Norway, in Germany and Great Britain, but we also know of a tour arranged by the Austrian company Österreichische Lloyd in 1913. Travel agents all around Europe organized these journeys. And it was not uncommon in the decades around 1900 to find several hundred tourists on one cruise ship. These tours were particularly popular among Germans, but many other tourists from Great Britain, France, Scandinavia, other European countries, North America and Russia participated, some even coming from South America and Southeast Asia. Unfortunately, in many cases, we do not know much about these tourists, except that they came from middle and upper, cl upper classes, since they could afford these journeys, but we do know that many women traveled on these tours. Actually, they often constituted about a third of the passengers also on the tours to Spitsbergen. And this actually shows the attraction the North held for women once it became accessible to them after many centuries of mostly men being allowed there. This map is a fold out map with photographs detailing various stops and sites. As you can see, the journey went from Stavanger in the south of Norway to the North Cape in the north. And this is the first page of this fold out map. And this is uh, the second. As you can see, the north of Norway is divided into places that bear names and others that remain anonymous. And the same goes for the photographs. They do not aim at showing all sides of the north, rather they select some, and through the selection process, turn them into touristic icons. So in other words, some aspects of the north are considered to be more important than others. The final stop, and probably the main attraction, and also the returning point of this particular journey is the North Cape. Other sites not to be missed are the Sami camps and Tromsø, the North Norwegian town I wish to concentrate on in this paper. We are so lucky to know a former owner of this map. And probably Frida Haupt was identical with the traveler on this tour. And we also can date this journey, the year this journey took place, most likely, as we can read here, in 1908. And this drawing by Frieda Haupt is on the last page of the Reisekart. And we can also see here two more icons of the North, a walrus and the midnight sun. Unfortunately, I have so far found out little else about Frieda Haupt. Or I, actually, I, I should say I found out too much about her as I have identified several Frieda Haupts across Europe who were alive in 1908. There is also a Prussian Frieda Haupt and she probably would fit with the attraction of the tours among German tourists. But as you can see, the map is in Norwegian, so maybe Frida was Scandinavian. And this is also one of the challenges working with souvenirs, how to trace the history of the owners. But we also need to inquire about the history of the object itself. It was most likely produced in Christiania, today's Oslo, after 1907. And it certainly had tourists traveling on steamers up north as its main target group. The language used indicates Scandinavian tourists, but then in particular German and Dutch speakers, but also others would not have had much difficulty in deciphering this map. Some souvenirs are singular and unique objects. Others are part of industrial mass production, 
with this map falling into the latter category. Well, I have now so far approached this souvenir from a variety of angles. One was the history of the souvenir. When was it produced? Where? Why? What was the target group? Who owned it? But also the materiality of the souvenir. What is it? Is it made of paper, cardboard? What, what can we, um, uh, and it, as you could see, it is made of paper and cardboard. And this also tells us something that a paper became cheaper and printing technologies advanced towards the end of the 19th century. And this also explains why we have so many albums, postcards and maps from this period. But I've also talked uh, a little bit about the function of this souvenir. It is a map. It indicates major sites, but it is also a status symbol of being able to travel there. And actually, it also might be considered a travel narrative as it narrates a, jour a journey. So far, I have mainly analyzed the role this object has played in a specific historical context, that of growing tourism to the north in the early 1900s and the, and the last decades of the uh, uh, 19th century. So I've, I've been mainly interested in its representational aspects. And such an approach has been the dominant focus among historians until recently, and maybe we could also say it still is. And it is a focus on what Frank Trentman calls symbolic communication. That means we historians analyze things or object so that we can learn more about identity formation on social, cultural, and political levels. Well, materi material culture studies have mostly moved away from such an approach and uh, towards uh, theoretical approaches, drawing on ANT, so actor network theory, with its focus on relations. So souvenirs here become a part of a network between humans and things. The map on the photographs on the map produce sites. They do not just represent them. They channel the tourist's gaze and turn some parts of the environment into places that are more special than others. Hence the cliff next to the North Cape, which you can't see here, remains anonymous and is assigned no significance, despite both being geologically similar and both being placed in the North. Objects act and souvenirs continue to do so when they are brought back home. They invoke memories. By being inserted into economic circulation and consumer society, they turn, to speak with Mike Ball, into telling objects. The history of senses and emotions, too, provides fresh perspectives on souvenirs. Think of touch, we can touch it, look at it, beautiful colors, the smell, you can't smell it, but I can smell it, as this kind of old <laughs> uh, feeling to it. It is a network uh, that extends to the present, with me using this object as an articulation of an emotional journey by a female traveler from more than 100 years ago. Souvenirs are also expressions of mundane magic, to quote Michael Haldrup. They are able to invoke a world beyond the everyday one. And we may speak of a disenchantment through mass production and a re-enchantment through memories assigned to it. And by this, actually, the North also becomes part of this magic. Well, I do not want to privilege one theoretical approach over the other. I think it's most productive when we try to tell stories from different angles and approaches and try to understand the multiplicality of these souvenirs and hence also to better comprehend the narratives of these journeys. Well, let me take another typical souvenir from the Norwegian North and from Tromsø in particular. When looking through my main sources from the time between the 1870s and the early 1900s, which are travel reports, postcards, albums, tourist brochures, newspaper advertisements, there are few souvenir types that are mentioned much more than others. 
In its first edition of Norway and Sweden from 1879, the then most popular tourist guidebook, Bedecker, informed its readers about three kinds of souvenirs they could acquire in Tromsø. Photographs of themselves, and I think actually this is a nice this is, this is nice because it is a nice reminder that taking selfies had been popular already in the 19th century. But the other thing one could acquire were photographs of Sami, the indigenous population of the North, and polar bear furs. And these could be purchased in various shops in town. It also recommended a visit to the Sami camp in Trumsdalen or Trumsdalen, as it, uh, as it was then called, where one also could buy Sami objects. Throughout the period I've been looking at, Sami products and photographs of Sami appear to have been the most popular souvenirs of the North. The second most popular one were products made of fur and skin, mainly polar bear, but also reindeer. Yet the latter, uh, the, the skin and, and fur were only ambivalently connected to the north and to Tromsø. They could, as we can uh, learn in Bedeka, also be purchased in Trondheim and Bergen. Interestingly, interestingly, in its ninth edition from 1903, fur is no longer listed as a recommended souvenir, even though we know it was still a popular souvenir. But looking at these um, objects, could we speak of two major types of souvenirs representing the North? One taken from nature, fur, and the other taken from culture, the then so-called ethnographic Sami objects. In many works on images and representations of the North, nature features prominently as a major characteristic, particularly of Norway. And this seems to be the case here as well. At the same time, this picture becomes more complex if we set aside the ontological distinction between nature and culture, between thing and human, between the material and the immaterial. As Strandman and others have pointed out, objects are not just passive, they are also active. And the question is rather how materiality changes and is assigned no meaning. Once a polar bear had been killed in the 19th century, and this was actually quite often the case, it entered a different stage with new meaning assigned to it. And as you can see, the polar bear fur in the shop is on display with many other furs and remains of other animals such as antlers and so on. They became part of an animal world dominated by humans and lost their specificity as kings of the North. And once they were transported back home, often to the continent, they became a trophy, or they were filed as objects in a museum. The fur itself remained alive, literally. It probably was inhabited by insects, bugs, and micro other microorganisms, which again changed depending on its geographical placement. Whereas the polar bear did not start off as a souvenir, but as an integral part of Northern nature, it became a souvenir once it entered economic circulation and was displayed at a shop. It became an artifact to be also inserted into tourist memories of the North. And of course, as all souvenirs, it may, after a while, have lost its function as a souvenir and become part of nature again. So rather than starting off with a distinction between culture and nature, souvenir objects, it may hence be more productive to ask about practices. How are souvenirs used and to what extent do they challenge our perception of the North and of Northern as primarily dominated by nature? In our outline of the conference, we state that we wish to provide critical perspectives on established notions of the Nordic. Souvenirs may help us to critically investigate such established notions. They are, after all, constantly transgressing the borders of Norden. And as my examples so far have shown, they also transgress borders in time and space. They challenge conceptions of the material versus the immaterial, of culture versus nature, 
and to create different meanings by adjusting to different knowledge regimes at specific times. Let me take another typical and highly popular souvenir from Tromsø, a postcard of the Sami families in Tromsdal. The Sami camp on the other side of the sound from Tromsø was the most popular tourist attraction in Tromsø, and with the exception of the North Cape and the Midnight Sun, probably also of the Norwegian North. The Sami themselves came from Sweden and were there during the summer times, and they helped to establish their camp as tourist attraction by selling homemade objects and also asking for money when being taken pictures of. They were an integral part of the itinerary of the cruise tours. And uh, there are many, many postcards which you can find of those in, uh, of, of, of the Sami in Tromsdalen. This postcard was posted in Olesund in 1906 by factory owner Niels Dewold and sent to Albert Müller in Berlin Schöneberg, who, according to the Berlin Addressbuch of 1906, was Kanzleirat, that is a title for a state official. I was not able to find out more about Albert Müller, but for my purpose here, the most interesting aspect is that Niels Dewold sent a postcard picturing Lappe Familiar i Trumsudalen from Olesund to an acquaintance in Berlin. We may assume that it was a business acquaintance since there are no personal greetings on this card. And the card itself was published by uh, BM Schoenberg's Kunstverlag in Christ Christiania. This card may hence never have been in Tromsø, but by its mere existence and through the practice of sending it, it becomes a souvenir from Tromsø. Another interesting fact is that this card is partially colored. Uh, the, well, let's just go back again to show you this. Um, you can see that the nominating colors are actually blue, red, and white. And these are, of course, also the colors of many traditional Sami clothes. But most tourists probably were reminded of the colors of the Norwegian flag, considering the visibility the Norwegian flag had on many tourist products at the time. So the card might transport a story of what is typical of the North and of Norway in general. Sami, representing Tromsø and Norway, although they came from Sweden. And interestingly, not reindeers, but dogs. But these stories may vary within Norway, depending on the knowledge one had of the North, as well as within Sweden, Germany, or other places where such postcards were circul circulated. And accordingly, the stories of the North and of Norden may also change. So, what we can see is that the map I started with created different stories about Norden by focusing on particular sites and leaving others out. And it certainly challenged the traditional notion of Norway's primarily, primarily defined via its nature through photographs which show lots of urban contexts. The map is also changing. Not only, not just the stories, but the map is also changing, not only because of it being transported from place to place, but also because its material quality changes quality changes, from new to used, for example. And Frieda Haupt also added some new stories, narratives to the map. So the question is also, um, when we talk about a souvenir, or whether it always has to be something material, or whether it also can be something which materializes through drawings, such as here, the Midnight Sun, in this example. Let me, be end, uh, let me end by showing you now this map <laughs> in a way, in a physical way. I would like to, uh, uh, in the past, last minute, to return to the life cycle or biography of this, my souvenir of the North. And I would like to entangle this with, with my own relations to the map in a kind of ethnographic approach. As we have seen, this map has an active and complex biography. It was produced in, in Christiania, at least that I can assume. Its first owner probably was Frieda Haupt. 
and she probably bought it back home to her tour, uh, back home after the tour. Depending on where the map was at a specific time, it added different stories to its biography and also told different stories of the North. It tells of beginning mass tourism. It tells um, of a different sites which influenced the gaze of the traveler by pointing some of them out as more important than others. And back home at Frieda Haupt's place, it probably told of experiences of the past and became part of a memory discourse of the North as a distant space. And it became part of consumer society once more when it more than 100 years later arrived at a bookshop in Germany, waiting to be sold to someone with interest in the North today. With me, it came back to Norway, became part of my research and teaching to finally being distributed to the world again by being reproduced here on the internet. And all of these stories add new layers to what North and Northern may say to consist of. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rikke, for introducing us to this really interesting souvenir. Uh, I have a question, if I may. Yeah, I was just wondering, because you, you said that a third of the passengers were female. Uh, but um, do you see this kind of reflecting, uh, reflected in the souvenir market? Are there kind of a gendering of the souvenirs? That there would be some souvenirs that would be explicitly marketed towards a um, female tourists, for example? Uh, uh, that's, a, that's a very interesting question. And I also um, thought about this, um, what kind of souvenirs, especially women, would take uh, back home. Um, but uh, if you look at the souvenir market at that uh, time, then uh, it's, the North is so gendered in kind of male terms still. So, uh, 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 of course, <laughs> male like that. <laughs> and um, it's um, so fur and antlers and uh, it, it seems to have been very, very, very popular. But of course, you know, if you think about the Sami ethnographic objects, which we have been immensely popular and you could buy all over Norway, then um, uh, some of them were, for example, I've, I've read a lot about spoons, Sami spoons, which you could buy. So if, if we think about, a, 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 I'm sure the Sami didn't produce them just to please uh, the, the, the female travelers, but this also may have been something which, um, which could uh, attract and uh, be interesting for both, uh, both uh, um, men and uh, uh, male and female travelers. But I mean, it is, it's very difficult to say. And of course, we, we also know about, uh, I've also found one reference to women travelers who, who went hunting and thought it was really exciting to have a first. So it's also very important not to just, you know, start uh, establishing a distinction between <laughs> the interests between uh, female and male souvenirs. But I haven't found much on um, about uh, them really thinking about a spe specific group of tourists. Uh, not not uh, neither in terms of gender or um, culture language group coming from, except that they have this in different languages. Feel free to uh, write a cue if you have any questions. Otherwise, I also have <laughs> you one, one thing that Ulrike and I never speaks to one another, but I have another question. And that also <laughs> because you mentioned that you can you could actually buy Sami objects all over Norway. Mm. But would that mean that you could, could kind of cheat and you could go to um, Bergen and write and buy Sami objects there and not having visited the actual Sami camps? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, um, I certainly know that you could buy them in Bergen and I assume also in Christiania. And um, I think this is also the point I wanted to make with the postcard. Uh, maybe Niels Dewold has never been to Tromsø, but this was not the point. It kind of represented something. It, it, it told something about the North. And uh, so I think this is what you call cheating. Yes, definitely. Um, if you only went to Bergen and didn't, or Trondheim, which for many was, was the final stop, and especially those who, who went to the west of Norway, 
and then you could just buy uh, Zami objects and, and say they came from the North and in a way cheat. But you know, for them, it was a representation of the North. And um, so it made sense in a way to take them back home, even if they hadn't visited it, it their camps. Mm -hmm. And we have a very interesting question from Gitte um, in the chat. Do you know whether the women were traveling with their husbands or on their own? Um, yes, yeah. This is one of my uh, side projects. I think this is so fascinating to find out more about uh, uh, female travelers. And which is actually pretty difficult. So I was very happy about the Frida Haupt <laughs> map. But um, I know that many of them were traveling with their families, husbands or daughters. We have quite some sources of uh, 17, 18 years old, 19 year old um, women who traveled with their, with their parents on the tours. And we have from time to time uh, references to women who travel uh, together with a female friend. But I haven't found a reference to a woman who travels on her own. But this also may be because they don't mention it. Yeah, but, uh, but this, uh, it, it, these two groups, families, uh, it, the family is definitely the biggest uh, group. And we also have a comment from Andy that, yeah, that there were Sami people in Bergen and Christiania, among other places, selling souvenirs to tourists. And that's, yeah, that's an important point. Yeah. Yeah, so you could you could you could buy them, but if you bought something which was um, uh, like the postcard, which says it is Tromsudalen, then uh, of course it was much more uh, strongly associated uh, with uh, with Tromsø. And um, and you could, as I say, buy them all over all over uh, Norway. Okay, I think. If there are no further questions and after a very long oh, and sorry. hard sorry, sorry. Uh, Janike, there's one more question actually yeah thank you Eva Johanna asked one yes um I think this is also um I I this, uh, thank you Eva Johanna for this question because I think this is uh also an uh, an uh very important uh uh, important point to make is that only because there is a tendency now to look less at identity formation, identity formation still is very important <laughs> and still uh, and was also a very important part of uh, tourist traveling. And I'm sure we will hear much more about this um, for the remaining two days. And uh, this was uh, in many travel narratives, this is exactly what they talk about, you know, how this kind of uh, changed also their, their ideas and how the memories brought back um, were important for their outlook uh, on, 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 not only on the, on the North, but also in general of the world. So um, I definitely think that we have to be careful with, you know, taking the kind of fashionable theories and um, uh, leaving out and uh, the others. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, okay, so now we have a break already. <laughs> uh, for this section, we have three uh, exciting papers and the first uh, one out is Alexandre Simon Eklan. Nice to see you, Alexandre. And he is a historian here at the University of Oslo and he is writing his dissertation on French polar exploration between 1860 and 1940. And focusing on the expedition projects and the French media of the time to understand why polar research did not really become more important in French cultural exploration. <clears throat> so we are very happy to have you here, Alexandre, and uh, we're looking forward to hearing your paper about French travelers and whale hunters. So please. Thank you. Uh, I want to say to that Ulrike is my PhD supervisor and I think this will become very obvious because we have a close interest and in my paper is also about tourism. I will show you my screen now. Is it working? This is my first presentation in Zoom. Okay. So, um, as you will see, like Ulrike, I will talk about uh, tourism in the end of the 19th century. 
but uh, I will focus on French travelers and I will focus on uh, one specific topic on their encounters with whales and with whaling in the end of the, of the 19th century. I want to start with this expression, an unbearable smell, because it struck me when I was reading the sources. Uh, it did not strike me uh, because of the expression itself, but because it's repeated in a lot, a lot of the French travel accounts to Norway at that time. And this repetition really made, made me think, it made me realize that everyone knew in advance that the smell was unbearable. So these, pe these French people who came to Norway and who looked at uh, dead whales, uh, stinking dead whales, knew beforehand that it was going to be disgusting, and yet they chose to come and they chose to see it. So the question I will try to answer during this presentation is uh, why? Why would they do that? Why would they continue coming to something that they knew was going to be disgusting? I will start by presenting who these tourists were and what they saw, where they went in northern Norway. Then I will explain how they tried to, to, to communicate their experience, their disgust to readers and through books. And then I will explain uh, the fascination they had for the, for the whales and the disappointment they expressed in their books around 1900 about whaling. So first I want to talk about the travelers, who they were and why they came to Norway. Uh, French tourism to Norway grew a bit uh, later than from uh, Germany or from uh, Great Britain, about 10 years later. So it started really in the 1880s. But at that time, most French people stopped in Trondheim because in Trondheim there was the train uh, to go to, back to Christiania, to Oslo. But afterwards, in the 1890s, and especially in the 1900s, French tourists to Norway uh, went on cruises, on, uh, on, on ship cruises, and these cruises were very costly. So this means that these people, these French people that traveled to Norway were rich people who had enough money to uh, take a few weeks away from their work and, and to pay for the, for the ship cruises, which were very exp expensive. So they were interested in whaling um, because it was a Norwegian specialty in the end of the 19th century and because it did not exist anymore in France. In France, the last, uh, the last whalers stopped in the 1860s. So whaling was one of the things that interested them in Norway, but it was not the main attraction. As you can see on the, on the title pages of their books, what really interested them the most were the midnight sun, the North, Ca the North Cape and the fjords. So the things that uh, Ulrike discussed in her presentation. I found 20 books, 20 travel accounts published in France between the 1850s and the First World War that talked about the whales and the whalers. There, is a very, there are two very clear publishing peaks. One is just after 1890, and the second one is around 1900. So this, this is the peak of this uh, wave of tourism, which becomes a mass tourism to Norway. So now that we know who these tourists were, uh, where did they go? Well, at that time in the 1890s, there were a few dozen whaling stations in Northern Norway, but most of these tourists actually saw the whales in the same place, only, on, only in one whaling station, which was located on the islet of Skoroy, or Sture Skoroy, which is located between Tromsø and the North Cape. So it's here and it's on this islet here. All of them were on the same place because uh, this, this particular whaling station had an arrangement with the cruise companies, with almost all of them. So when a whale had been caught uh, near Skoda, the cruise captains who were in Trumsa were warned and then they knew that they could take the detour. And these maps are from the, the Bedecker, the French uh, travel guide for, uh, for Norway uh, of 1898. And as you can see on these maps, you have a full line, which is the normal route that the ships would take between Trumse and the North Cape. And then you have uh, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, interrupted line here, which is uh, going to Skoda when I was away. So on the islet of Skoda, um, there, this was a functioning waiting station. So it was a real waiting station. It was not just for the tourist, but it was very adapted for the tourist. So as you can see, from afar here, there are decorations which were made with whale bones to impress the tourists. You can see them closer on these two photographs. So they were very, very impressive. And um, one could also buy souvenirs, of course, as uh, Ireke mentioned uh, earlier. So here, the souvenirs one could buy were pieces of whales. So pieces of the whales' bodies, usually ears or pieces of bones. This was uh, 
Ulrich mean, distinguish between the souvenirs of a northern culture and nature. This is decidedly on the nature side. This was a successful place because in total, more than 2,000 people signed the guest book in a period of uh, about 10 years. So, Scott, this is where these French tourists experience the disgust they try to describe in their book. And uh, I, will now, I will now look at this disgust. So, it's important to note, I think, that uh, the only tourists whose experience I can access are the tourists who wrote travel accounts and who managed to publish them. So they are not just tourists in this study, they are also authors with very uh, variable talent. Some were good and some were not very good. And all of them tried to communicate to their readers their experience and what they had felt on this island on, uh, on Skolay. As I have already said, the, the descriptions of the unbearable smell were the most common in these books, but they were not the only ones. And they, these authors used other senses to try to convey what they had felt. So the, the sense of sight, for instance, was very important because uh, the thing with, with whales is that they are interesting because they are so big. So you had to convey this feeling, which is linked to sight, somehow. When the authors were not good enough, publishers would use illustrations like this one or like this one. This one is, is quite uh, uh, typical for the period because it's an engraving which was easier to make in a book than a photograph like this one. And also because you see you have people there that are um, serving as scale. So these people there, they are indicating how big the whale is. These illustrations were often reused from other books that were not, uh, not original. So the sense of sight was, uh, was very important for these tourists to transmit their experience, but the sense of touch was also very important, and this was not possible to, to transmit through illustrations, so they only had their words. What they insisted on when it came to touch were two things. The first is the, the greasiness, the oiliness of everything on this island, because the whale fat was making the ground slippery. So some, some of these tourists would fall and then would describe how uh, but greasy it was to, <laughs> to fall in the way fat. The other thing that was important when it came to touch was the, the touching of the skin of the whales, uh, which were killed. So what, what uh, happens in, in some occasions described in these books is that dead whales on the shore like this were used as a sort of dock. So the small, the small boats coming from the big cruise ship would arrive here and then they would stop along the whale the tourists would disembark on the whales and then they would walk on the stomach of the whales and until the shore. So they would experience very directly the, the dead bodies of the whales. So other senses were important, but still it's smell that was the, the, most, the, the most important thing for them. Now to show how strong the feeling, the smell was, they insisted on the techniques they used to, uh, to try to cover the smell and they insisted on the fact that they did not work, they were not enough. The first technique some used was to try to smoke, to try to cover the smell, but this was clearly not effective enough. So the, the most common technique was to have a, an handkerchief in front of the face, which was full of perfume. But so most of the most of the tourists considered this to be better, but not all of them, and some actually thought it to be worse because uh, they thought that the mixtures, the blending of uh, the smell of dead ways and of a uh, sort of cologne was even worse than only having one of those. So in short, this was for them a disgusting experience. Uh, at least this is why, what they really tried to, to get through in their books. So this disgust was very strong, but uh, historians of the senses like Alain Corbin have taught us that uh, we should not take these uh, sorts of sensory perceptions for something ahistorical or universal. So it is not, it's not a natural reaction in front of the whales. It is something that is culturally determined to. And after all, you had workers, Norwegian workers on Skore that worked with this smell every day and that tolerated it. So I will not try to explain why these tourists, these French people felt such a strong disgust, stronger than the workers. And the first element of, expl of explanation is that on a general level, as Alain Cordon has showed, the elites, so the, these sorts of, uh, of tourists, for instance, uh, during the 19th century progressively rejected the heavy smells and avoided the contact of the poor, of the workers that they considered to be smelly. And instead, they, they um, tried to take refuge on the mountains and among flowers where the air was 
supposed to be better and when the smells were not so strong. And this is exactly how this station was designed because as you can see on the coast level, you have the whaling installation, which is close to the whale bodies, of course. But then if you get higher up on the hill, you have this house, which was the manager's house with a whaling museum on the first floor and the decoration. And there was a garden uh, with flowers at that time. Some of the tourists describe exactly that. So they explained that when they could not tolerate the smell any longer, they would just get higher up on the hill and uh, into this house and uh, in the garden of flowers. So these people were indeed more sensible to smells because they were unused to them. They, they were used to avoiding them, except in this instance. Another reason for their strong reaction was that they were unused to uh, the site of violence against animals and the site of butchering animals. This was due to laws in France from uh, dating for, for the first ones from the French Revolution, which uh, largely shielded this sort of people from that. During the French Revolution, Napoleon Bonaparte, uh, when, when he became emperor, decided that it was no longer possible, it was no longer nice to have uh, butchers walking in the street, which was the custom earlier. So, uh, until the French Revolution, people could see uh, animals killed in the street by the butchers. After, after Napoleon, this was not possible anymore, it was illegal, and only workers working in, uh, in the abattoir in France uh, would see what was done to these animals. Other laws followed and, um, during, the, during the rest of the 19th century, and in the end, they prohibited any violence against animals in public. So this means for these tourists that uh, at the time when they came to Scotland, it was illegal in France to beat a dog in the street or to beat a horse in the street. So it was something they were not used to. So this disgust was clearly strong and it's because they were especially prone to be disgusted by these sorts of scene because they were unused to the, to the smell and they were unused to the sight of this sort of thing. I will now address the fascination they had for the whales and, the, and, and that, it, that turned into a disappointment around 1900. So first, they kept on visiting this island in spite of the disgust because they were too fascinated. They were fascinated for two reasons. The first one was that they were fascinated by everything that disgusted them. This was not only about the whales. Uh, in this sense, visiting whaling stations is comparable to other touristic practices of that time, like what was called fashionable slumming, in which upper class people like these would visit poor districts in cities to experience what it felt like to be among the poor, to be among the smelly poor, and to in the, in the places they saw as crime ridden. So it fascinated them because it was disgusting. It also fascinated them because it was whales, and the whales have been long a source of fascination for, for everyone because of their size, of course, which is again illustrated on this one with people serving a scale. So the whales have long fascinated people, but during the 19th century, this fascination changed. Originally, they were seen as monsters, and in the 1830s, for instance, Xavier Narnier speaks of their monstrous heads, and you could find uh, such adjectives, monstrous and, and the like, uh, in many travel accounts at that time. But progressively, during the 19th century, another discourse developed on the side of this discourse on the whales as monsters. And this new discourse presented the whales as beautiful creatures, which were especially nice and relatable when they were seen playing in the sea. So by 1900, especially, the whales were now seen with, with a sympathy. These tourists who came to Norway, they saw them as relatable animals, so in a way closer to the humans than to the monsters they were seen as earlier. It's uh, quite clear in some, of the, in some of the books, because some, some, uh, some like Jules Leclerc, uh, tried to um, wrote poems to the whales. So this is not a poem about uh, the whales in general. This is a poem about one specific whale, sorry, that Jules Leclerc saw being flensed. So he was a dead whale and he decided to write a poem for this one. Uh, I will read it in French because it's easier for me and because it uh, rhymes better. Ô oh, lamentable sort de celle qui fut reine, des mers de l'océan son immense domaine, qui du déluge ancien était contemporaine, et qui de notre faune est encore suzeraine. So this is just one, one verse from a long poem, which is uh, several pages long in the book. 
So what's interesting here is that uh, the idea expressed by Jules Leclerc is that what's done to the whale is unfair. It's not, it's not okay for him anymore to be killing the whales and to be influencing them. And this is an indication that this fascination for the whales, increasingly for the living whales and not the dead ones, had consequences for the way whaling in general was perceived. Because when these tourists arrived in Norway, these French tourists, what they imagined about whaling was this. This is a, a, a classical, a very traditional way of seeing whaling, which is uh, a huge whale and small humans trying to happen it, and this looks like a dangerous situation. These sorts of whalers were seen as courageous people, braving uh, many dangers for, for their work. But this was not what whaling was in that time when these French tourists arrived in Norway. What whaling was in that time was something more like this. It was modernized because of the uh, inventions of Sven Foyn in the 1860s. So Sven Foyn invented, for instance, this sort of thing that is a harpoon gun, which uses powder to, to project a harpoon very far and very strongly with explosive harpoons. These inventions, they, uh, they saved whaling, and especially Norwegian whaling, because they allowed to hunt more species that were not possible to hunt before. It was much less dangerous for the whalers, which was a good thing for them, but for the tourists, this took away, um, the tourists saw the whales as relatable animals now, so this sort of cannon just made them, uh, made the tourists feel like this was a massacre and not a noble hunt anymore. I will give you two examples of this. Uh, this first one, only a few years ago, this fishing was a veritable struggle, a fair duel between man and animal. And the idea here, of course, is that this duel is not fair anymore. So the whales have no chance. And this, this, is not, this is not good. Second example, the whale, which cannot fight anymore, will disappear from the seas, killed by the cannon like a simple human. This one is interesting because there are two, in, two ideas in there. The first one is, uh, in the end, like a simple human. So uh, like I said, the whales are now relatable. They are closer to the humans than to the monsters. And the second idea is the idea that they can disappear from the seas. Because this, this growing empathy for the whales is in fact not, not only about the whales. It's an indication that uh, at that time, it's the moment when the conservationist discourse was gaining ground in France and in the rest of Europe. So in the 1900s, for instance, the scientists of the Museum National du Naturel in Paris, they officially took position for protecting nature and for protecting the species that were in danger of being overhunted. The whales were a perfect symbol for this uh, overhunting and destruction of, of species, especially because uh, Frenchmen had stopped whaling. So uh, den denouncing whaling had no consequence for France. This discourse, on, this conservationist discourse, was not limited to the scientists. And most of the tourists that I look at here in this corpus denounced whaling as a modern whaling as an unfair massacre. Uh, for several reasons. For most of them, it was mostly because overhunting meant that they could not see living whales. They could only now see dead whales on scholarly, and dead whales were not a sufficient substitute for what they wanted to see. So the disgust they experienced in front of the dead whales was now just reminding them how nice it would have been to see the whales in the water. Some of the tourists went even farther than that and joined the scientists in denouncing whaling as something more general, as a hunt uh, leading to, a to the destruction of the whales for a profit, so for capitalist uh, reasons. So in, in other words, they used whaling as a symbol of a more general problem, which is mankind's greed and mankind's abuse of nature. Now, whaling was for forbidden in Northern Norway in 1904, and the whaling scenes were now available to tourists only farther north in Spitsbergen. It was not the point of this interdiction, but it was very good for the tourists going to the North Cape because it meant that they could now see more whales than earlier. To conclude, because I'm running out of time, um, this disgust was indeed very strong and uh, many authors struggled actually to, to express it as strongly as they would have liked, but all of them were very disgusted and they were more disgusted than other people would have been in their place because they were not used to seeing animals killed and butchered in France. The smell was an especially strong experience for these tourists because they usually avoided this sort of heavy smells. So why did they keep on visiting then? Well, they kept on visiting because they were far too fascinated, because uh, they were fascinated for everything that they, they had a fascination for everything that disgusted them. And they had a fascination for the whales, which was very strong. 
But this fascination for the whales changed. Now it had to be living whales, seen with sympathy, and the dead whales uh, by 1900 were no longer a good substitute for these living ones. So in a way, disgust, the disgust they experienced on the island of Skore was a way to sensibilize these tourists to uh, conservationism, because when they were faced with the concrete reality of what was, do was done to the whales, suddenly they became against the overuse and, uh, of nature and the environment. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for that fascinating paper, Alexandre. So I would just like to remind you that if you have questions, just write the letter Q in the chat box and I will, will grant you the word. While we're waiting, I would just like to ask you one thing because you mentioned this whaling museum. Uh, was that kind of a part of the tour <laughs> that they had yeah, to go through this yeah, museum yeah, and then? Yeah. It was so, so it was one of the places on the island where tourists could uh, take refuge from the smell. So it was, uh, I will share this, uh, I will share the PowerPoint again. It was uh, on the first floor of the, of the house. So the second floor was the place where the manager of the factory was living. And the first floor was for the tourists. So it was a museum. I don't know what was in there, but it was uh, apparently uh, a museum dedicated to whaling. Ulrike, please go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, uh, thank you, Alexandre. This was uh, really fascinating. And um, I think uh, it's also in my own research, I could see so often the, the, how the discourse about hunting changes towards the end of the 19th century from being a, you know, something which, uh, which uh, is an accepted pastime to being actually something which is considered by many, not by all, of course, but by many tourists as problematic. So this fits very well yeah, with what, we, what you have said. But I also thought about um, what you can also see and which you also showed uh, very nicely is that towards the end of the 19th century, there is definitely a commodif commodification process of the North. And um, the, the question is, the North had for such a long time this association of the wild North and uh, um, it is dangerous to go there and so on, it's an adventure. But um, uh, how do you think it is, uh, this, 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 this fascination for the, the smell also is a reaction to this commodi commodification? Because in a way, because of the smell, you still get uh, the real noise. And even though you can't maybe not see it anymore because of the new hunting methods, but at least you can smell it. Yeah, maybe. Uh, yes, uh, it might be true for the whales. I think it's true, at least for the Sami people, because these travel accounts usually uh, in, insisted on the fact that they were smelly, or that they were not as smelly as they would have imagined, which is uh, interesting. So uh, yes, I, I think so, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We also have a question from Shashti Bala. So please, Shashti. Yeah, thank you for a very interesting presentation, Alexandre. Uh, I was wondering, I, I was very fascinated by what you told, you, uh, told us about disgust. And I was when, wondering whether you're going to look into disgust also from an interdisciplinary point of view, for example, anthropology. Uh, the answer is yes, I would if I could, and I cannot now because I have to focus on my dissertation, and this is not a part of it. But later okay. on, I would absolutely, I would absolutely like to to to, to uh, research more about disgust and other emotions, and to do this in an inter interdisciplinary fashion. So I, I would like to. Uh, I can't do it right now, but I would love to. Mm. <laughs> Perfectly <laughs> understandable. <laughs> I, I could also just add with this discuss the fascination. Um, was there any part of this um, this kind of continuing uh, going to to watch these uh, dead whales? Was there any kind of did this play in uh, into it? This idea that Norway was backwards in any way uh, in comparison to the legislation uh, of animals, for example, in in France at the same time. Um. Yes, I think it does fit into that partly, but it fits more in, in 
uh, in fit into that in the idea in the sense that um, the, this modernization of whaling was very disappointing for the tourists. So in a way, they were imagining uh, at least the north of Norway as a, a place which was supposed to be backwards, which was, and as Elika said, this was something they were looking after. So th this was what they were after in northern Norway, and this is not what they found in this island. It was far too modern for that, for that at least. Uh, Silje Gaupset, please. Okay, the unmute button is, is different from Zoom, so, but I found it. <laughs> so thank you for an interesting uh, talk. And I was wondering, do you know anything about the scope of this kind of whaling station tourism, where there's other, other whaling stations, museums at the time? And how were these tours advertised? Did the tourists know what they were heading into? <laughs> Um, yeah, thank you. It's an interesting question. Um, I, I think it was the only one in Northern Norway because all the, all the cruise companies had an arrangement with this one. So in all my sources, uh, people saw it in this, uh, in this particular place. So I, I think it is the only one under a condition. And yes, uh, to, to, and in answer to your second question, yes, people knew what they were looking, uh, what, what they were going to see because it was in the Bedeker uh, in the 1890s both in the French edition and in, the, in all the editions, actually. But uh, what's interesting is that the English edition uh, really insists, uses a lot of adject adjectives to, to say that it will be disgusting, it will be very strong smell and the like. But the French edition is much more tame when it comes to using adjectives. So they say that it will be a strong smell, but they don't say that it will be disgusting. But people knew it anyway, because uh, these travel accounts that I, uh, that I showed you, uh, I showed you the title pages, they copied each other all the time. So for, for 30 years, the, I mean, everyone knew, or all these tourists knew beforehand that this was going to be disgusting. disgusting. So it was, uh, it was advertised in a way, but not all, the, not all the cruises stopped there. It was only when there was a, a dead whale that they would stop there. So there was a museum and the like, but the main attraction remained the, the whale bodies themselves. Not just the museum. Thank you so much, Alexandre. I think we will have to move on to our next uh, speaker, which is Toril Yesvik. So nice to see you and to meet you, Toril. <laughs> We've only been emailing. Uh, and Toril is an art historian and she wrote her PhD dissertation on roads in Norwegian 19th century art. And she has a long experience, experience as an art mediator and art critic. And she's also been a senior lecturer both at the University of Oslo and the University of Stavanger. And she has been part of the research projects Roots, Roads and Landscapes, Aesthetic Practices on Roots 1750 to 2015 and contributed to several publications. Now, in 2018, she published her book, Fotograf Knut Knutsen, Veien, Reisen og Landskapet, which is also the topic of a presentation here today. So we are very much looking forward to hearing more about this, Toril. I give you the word. Thank you. And thank you so much for inviting me. I will uh, share my screen with you. Can you all see and hear? Yeah, good. Oh, oh wait, wait a second. I've, uh, <laughs> we'll go. There we are. Okay. Um, yeah, you've already mentioned um, uh, my reason for being here, uh, the background from uh, the research project and also from my PhD and uh, the book on Knut Knutsen. Um, I want to say that um, I've been inspired from many different sources in my work on Knut Knutsen, but um, I, will, um, like to, I would like to emphasize uh, the inspiration from uh, cultural geography and landscape theory. Uh, in uh, cultural geography, there has been a tendency in recent years to focus on um, landscape as a practice and landscape as something, as a sort of multi-sensory, um, uh, something multi-sensory we, we move through and move in, in opposition to uh, the tradition, more traditional um, 
uh, way of conceiving the landscape as something we look at. And uh, I think this uh, links quite nicely up to Ulrike's, what you said, Ulrike, in your, uh, in your talk. Uh, in my work on Knutsen, I've really been interested in linking these two ways of conceiving the landscape, uh, both as uh, practice and as representation. And I've done that by trying to follow Knutsen uh, on, his, on some of his travels through uh, the Norwegian landscape. So that is partly what I'm going to talk about. But uh, given the topic of, uh, of this conference, I also wanted to point out a couple of links between Knutsen's work and uh, travel writing and travel narratives. Um, yeah, so uh, I'll do that as we go along. But first, a few uh, words about uh, Knut, uh, Knutsen. Um, probably you don't all uh, know, know him previously. Uh, he is one of uh, Norway's uh, photographic pioneers. He was one of the first to specialize uh, in landscape photography and he traveled all over Norway in quest for motifs. Uh, the preserved photographs and uh, glass plate negatives after Knutsen uh, counts approximately 37,000 items and they've been uh, defined as uh, Norway's, as a part of Norway's contribution to the memory of the world register. Knudsen was born in Odda, a small village in the Hardanger region, uh, and when he was about 10 years old, he moved uh, to Bergen, uh, and from then on he lived together with his grand aunt's family uh, and worked in their shop, um, and each summer he returned to uh, Odda, where his family <coughs> lived at uh, a farm called Torkheim. Knudsen became quite early an experienced traveller, from uh, travelling back and forth between urban Bergen and rural Odda. And at the age of 30, before he started his career as a photographer, he went to Europe for about a year. Uh, to study fruit farming in uh, southern Germany. And he traveled through Holland, uh, Germany and Denmark uh, on the way. A couple of years earlier, he had learned photography, probably by Bergen's first uh, photographer, Marcus Selmer. And he brought his camera uh, and took some of his first photographs on this tour. Uh, and then after returning to Bergen, he decided to become a professional photographer and he opened his uh, photographic studio in 1864 and was active until about 1900. And he was really successful both as a photographer, he exhibited, uh, got several medals, for example, on world exhibitions. And uh, he also set up this building where he established a new um, a photographic studio and shop uh, during the 1880s. This is a building centrally located in uh, the center of, uh, of Bergen. Um, during the 19th century, Norway experienced far-reaching infrastructural developments. At the beginning of the 19th century, there were only a handful of carriage roads. Uh, from the 19, oh, sorry, from the 1840s and onwards, a revolution in transport occurred, and many new roads and bridges uh, were built. And by the end of the 19th century, Norway had gained a considerable network of roads, uh, of drivable roads, connecting different parts uh, of the country. Um, these changes coincided with uh, uh, Knutsen's career as a photographer. And he was very well aware of these infrastructural changes. Um, a substantial number of his photographs, uh, you can see some examples here, include roads, railways, bridges, canals, steamships, etc. Uh, and seen together, they really give us a unique insight into the shaping of the modern Norwegian landscape. And the range and quality of these photographs 
revealed that he was deeply fascinated by these developments. And of course, he enjoyed the practical advantages of using new roads and railways, but he also had a very keen eye for their aesthetic, uh, aesthetic qualities and their visual impact on the landscape. In several um, photographs, he, um, he uh, shows aspects of his own practice, as you can see in this one. Uh, he clearly situates himself and his photographic practice by including his own means of transport and his photographic equipment in uh, this image. It was taken in the autumn of 1881 on one of his tours in Western Norway. And uh, the road show how he has arrived uh, and um, how this landscape was made accessible to him. Traveling as a photographer at this time involved bringing a lot of heavy equipment. For example, you can see the, uh, the uh, boxes with the uh, glass plate negatives. And also he had to develop his uh, photographs immediately, which meant that he had to uh, have, take with him a complete uh, portable dark room. Uh, and you can see the dark room tent in the background. And this is not unique. It took several uh, photographs where he included uh, this darkroom tent. Um, and I think it's a very interesting example of kind of photographic self-reflection, uh, which seems distinctly modern. And two elements in this uh, photograph are implied but not shown, which is uh, the horse and the coachman. Uh, we believe that uh, Knudsen used uh, the Norwegian system of conveyance, which uh, means that he uh, ordered uh, uh, horses and the coachman um, at different posting stations. And uh, probably he went mostly alone without assistance. Uh, when he stopped uh, at this spot, he also took another photograph. And uh, the titles of these two photographs probably indicates why. He uh, photographed the, the mountain you can see in the background, Hunindals Rokken. Uh, Knudsen might have read about Hunindals Rokken in a travel guide, uh, Illustrated Norway Handbook for Travelers, published in 1879 uh, by the publisher and editor Christian Tunsberg. Tunsberg described the mountain as easily accessible and strongly recommended the magnificent view from the top. Mountaineering was becoming increasingly popular among tourists and uh, it's not unlikely that Knudsen had these customers in mind when he took this particular picture. Um, Knudsen, uh, Knudsen's photograph also is connected to another form of travel uh, writing, um, the genre of uh, voyage pittoresques or uh, picturesque journeys, a kind of travel account consisting of landscape prints accompanied by short texts. And here you see uh, two examples of uh, such uh, uh, picturesque journeys. Uh, I will show you two examples where Knudsen uh, takes photographs closely resembling uh, pictures already made from uh, Corpelan's uh, Voyage Pittoresque from uh, the early 19th century. First, this one uh, from Kruklava, a road uh, not so far from uh, Oslo, uh, and really the first magnificent view on the road, on the main road from Christiania to Bergen. And uh, it's fascinating that some of these uh, picturesque journeys, they do follow a kind of imaginary journey, in this case, going from the capital and to Bergen. So it's really a kind of narrative uh, there as well. Um, and this is from uh, the same Kretblan uh, picturesque journey, and again, Knudsen's uh, interpretation uh, of the same motive. Uh, this is from Kvamskleiva, a very 
steep and notorious um, road going uh, from uh, uh, the valley of Valdres and up to the mountain plateau of Filfjell. So you can see that Knutsen really knew the, uh, the previous um, uh, pictorial tradition very well. Um, and in, uh, here you can also see that he uh, uses the road as a kind of platform from which he takes uh, his uh, picture, which is quite interesting. The way the, the road is, um, you know, shapes his uh, gaze in a way. Um, this uh, photograph is also uh, interesting for another reason, because if you look closely on uh, Knudsen's photograph, you can see not only the road going up to the mountain area, but you can see a road going along the, um, the, the uh, coast of the lake. And that was a new road. And it illustrates uh, a new um, uh, ideal within Norwegian road technology that was introduced around 1850. And um, they started building roads, uh, sort of following the, the natural lines of the landscape more closely. And they also wanted to avoid these very steep uh, climbs. Um, and uh, um, uh, the most famous of this type of road, uh, where the um, uh, where these roads from going from uh, the mountains and down to the valleys, the sort of serpentine roads you see uh, an example of here. Uh, this is Stalheimskleiva, which is uh, really one of uh, Norway's uh, most uh, famous roads and also most famous and iconic landscapes. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, how, how much time do I have left actually? <laughs> Uh, you have, um, I think, maybe um, six, seven, eight minutes. Okay, thanks. <laughs> yeah, this is a photograph of Stalheim's Kleiva that uh, uh, Knutsen took uh, quite late in his career. Uh, it's one of the landscapes and one of the roads uh, which Knutsen uh, photographed most frequently. And um, uh, the road itself uh, was built in 1849 and it was widely admired and really considered a masterpiece of, uh, of engineering. And it quickly became uh, a famous uh, tourist attraction uh, as well. Um, if we look at some of the earlier uh, pictures of uh, Stalheim, uh, you can see that uh, uh, in this particular photograph, Knutsen really uh, is quite close to earlier uh, pictures. Uh, here you see four examples. Uh, one of them, uh, the, the painting by Isadal from Stalheim, which is really one of the most famous Norwegian uh, paintings. Uh, and but all of, uh, uh, all of those four, these four pictures really concentrate on the magnificent view you can have from the top of uh, Stalheim. And uh, when I wrote my PhD, um, I, uh, I was really interested in uh, uh, how uh, Knutsen worked and uh, in studying in more detail his uh, uh, approach to Stalheim in his early photographs, I found uh, a very different uh, approach that I will show you now. Um, and uh, first of all, he starts uh, in uh, he starts from the opposite uh, direction. Uh, and uh, yeah, before I show you the photographs, I will say a couple of words about uh, my working method uh, when I uh, when I did this work because um, there are really, uh, it's really uh, very little um, 
uh, written sources after Knudsen. Um, but this particular document that you see here is sales catalog that was published in 1889 has been a really a real key document for me. Um, there he uh, lists uh, all his uh, photographs and uh, they are ordered according to picture size and then according to geographic area and they're each given a number. And these numbers in the catalog uh, uh, corresponds to the numbers that Knudsen uh, wrote on his gla glass plate negatives. So in this way it's actually possible to sort of follow him almost uh, uh, as he uh, moves through the landscape. So I wanted to try out uh, what uh, that method would sort of give uh, to uh, our understanding of, of his pictures and of his working method. Okay, so these are some of the first uh, photographs from, uh, that Knudsen took uh, from Stahlheim. Uh, on this first tour, uh, which uh, took place sometime between 1865 and 1870, he took, uh, I think, 28 photographs from uh, the bottom of the valley uh, and up to uh, the posting station at Stalheim. I will show you eight of these. Uh, and what is very uh, significant is that he uh, shows the road in almost all of these. So he uses the road as a kind of axis of orientation. And he stops every now and then to try out and explore new uh, viewpoints. Um, and as you can see, he's not really concerned about this magnificent view from the road uh, in many of these pictures. He is more concerned about uh, the materiality of the road, uh, the road surface, uh, the meeting points between the road and uh, the river or the, and the waterfall and so on. So I think it really brings out some, some other perspectives uh, that are quite interesting. And then when he uh, finally uh, reaches the top um, and the posting station, then he turns around and uh, uh, sort of takes this more traditional uh, viewpoints uh, uh, that, uh, that he also explores later on. Um, I also wanted to bring in briefly um, a reference to cultural historian Bjarne Rogan, who has been uh, working with the materiality of the journey. And he's, uh, he suggests that um, when tourists came to Norway, they were not only interested in looking at, the, uh, looking at nature, but they also were interested in having a particular sort of driving experience and the experience of driving through the Norwegian landscape in these carriols that you see an example of here. So many travel descriptions, they are really full of um, descriptions of roads and also descriptions of, uh, of traveling on the road. And uh, Bjarne Rogan calls uh, the carriole the, the racing car of, uh, of the age. Um, and there are several descriptions of these really exhilarating driving experiences through the landscape. And here you see uh, one of, also one of his late photographs of, uh, of Stahlheim. And you can try to imagine uh, driving downwards uh, in a carriole with no brakes. Um, <laughs> and uh, ending off, uh, I just wanted to bring in uh, uh, one of Knudsen's albums, um, uh, just to give you an idea of how these photographs were sold, because uh, uh, Knudsen's main uh, group of customers were tourists, and this was before the, the age of the postcard, uh, so, uh, in many cases, he sold 
uh, albums that uh, the tourists could either sort of compile themselves or they could uh, buy uh, albums that had been arranged uh, for them. Yeah, I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Turi. That was very uh, exciting. And I have never seen any of these photographs before. So this was kind of a new, new kind of uh, traveling or, or tourism for my part. So again, please write to the queue if you have any questions. Yeah. Uh, OK, so I think uh, Jakob I saw first. So I will give, give you the word Jakob first, and then I have the list. Uh, <coughs> Torrid, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Good. Uh, thank you for an extremely interesting, interesting talk. Uh, uh, I just wondered on so many aspects of this uh, to discuss, but could you tell us a little bit more about Knutsen's motivation? What made him interested and what made him so dedicated? Uh, I mean, what he has done for for, for Norway, for Norwegian inhabitants and, and Europe, really, documenting not, not, just, not just these, these uh, wonderful, uh, I mean, not just the photographs of, of, of places uh, around Norway, but also, uh, as you said, this um, extremely important phase of Norway's modernization, not least with a view to communication. Mm -hmm. um, can you say a few more words about his about his uh, his urge and and motive motivation to to do this and and to be to remain so consistent mm. uh, over so many years yeah. you know this is a very very tricky question because he left uh, i mean we we don't have a single word from him about his motivations Hmm. So it's very hard to know. I, we, we have all these wonderful photographs, so I, I really think we have to, uh, we have to sort of, um, uh, we have to look at the photographs, and, yeah. uh, and, and, and there we can see this motivation and this fascination. But um, it's very hard to, to know uh, why. Hmm. Um, uh, and that is fas fascinating, you know, because it is, it, it is. they document, the photographs document uh, an unusual kind of consistent dedication to a lifelong project. Yes, I, I yeah. do agree. I do agree. Oh. And, uh, um, uh, you know, it's also difficult to know because we, we know so little about which of the photograph uh, photographs sold well, you know, and mm. so you, you could imagine that some of the fo photographs he took sort of privately, you know, as a private project, and some others he sold, but we know hardly anything about that either, and he very uh, consistently um, listed uh, all his photographs in this catalogue, so he, he, he really didn't uh, uh, separate, you know, between uh, sort of more explorative photographs and uh, the ones he sold. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I have Ulrike on my list. Yes, thank you, Tori. This was very, very interesting. And I also thought your, your point um, about uh, that we, we have to be uh, careful with making a, a, a too strong uh, differentiation between uh, nature and uh, technology, culture, whatever you want to mm. call it. I think this is, is, is very important that you showed it beautifully. And I also thought about um, travel reports in the second half of the 19th century and how experiencing new technology was a part of traveling to Norway. It was not just to see nature, but you also wanted to see actually new technology and new road technology and so on. So I think um, my, my, my travelers also <laughs> support your argument here. But um, what I wonder is uh, still about the, um, 
about the way these uh, uh, photographs were distributed and what kind of uh, motifs mm. were actually more popular than others. Mm. And um, because when I think about the travel reports in my, uh, which I'm working on, then uh, quite a few refer or use photos. Mm. Um, uh, from there, and they often are not not about nature, but actually about you know roads and uh, mm. and so on and carriages. So, um, do you know anything about this? Uh, well, uh, as I mentioned, we know very little about uh, which of the motifs uh, that sold well, uh, and you know uh, which ones didn't sell well. Um, but we do know quite a lot about uh, his, uh, his network, his sales network. So, um, you know, posting stations, hotels, etc. Uh, they had uh, photographs uh, in commission. Uh, and, uh, and also, um, we do have some uh, of his uh, copybooks from the last part of his career. And they are very interesting uh, because uh, there you really get an impression of uh, the range of his customers. And they were not, I mean, there were many, of course, many Norwegian customers, uh, but there were also a lot of, you know, private persons uh, uh, in Europe, in America, uh, even in Australia, he tried to sell photographs. <laughs> so uh, that's quite fascinating to to uh, and should be looked into more thoroughly actually thank you i would just like to add just because i've been working on uh, photographs from the canadian arctic but this is in the 1950s so it's been a completely different time but you would have kind of similar uh, photographs of roads also there, but then they would be commissioned by the government to kind of demonstrate that um, the government uh, is present and also, you know, using money on uh, communication and transport. So kind of different, um, yeah, it's interesting that he did this on his own initiative. Yeah, that's, that's right. And uh, um, I, it, I tried to see if I could find a connection between uh, uh, Knudsen and the road author authorities. Uh, but I, I never found it. Uh, <laughs> and we know that the road authorities uh, used uh, uh, photographs and they, they have this wonderful album, you know. Uh, but I don't believe uh, they used Knudsen's uh, photographs, uh, photographs for some strange reason. <laughs> Okay, I don't have any more questions on my list, so I say thank you again, Turil, and we're ready for our final speaker this uh, session before the next break, which is Andrew Newby, which is also very nice to see and, and meet. And um, he is a um, Nordic Studies Scholar at the University of Helsinki, and he's been um, researching on Nordic societies with a particular emphasis on the history and society of Europe during the long 19th century. And recently he has been working on themes related to famine and then especially the great, great uh, Finnish famine of the 1860s 60s and its commemoration. And among his many publications, I just want to mention the, the most recent one, his article, Fear and Loathing at 70 Degrees North, Finnish Migra Migration to Norway along the Old Path to Ruya and the Resistance to the Exodus that Aroused During the Great Hungry Years of the 1860s. So we are very happy to have you, you here, Andrew, and we're looking forward to hearing more about Wilson's Norwegian tour. Thanks, Yannick. Uh, it was funny to hear that title of that chapter being read out. It, it was just um, a short piece. It's not, uh, it's easy to find, but it's not a proper academic article, but it's a preview for some of the work I'm doing for my famine book. Um, well, thank you all. I'm so sorry not to be there in Oslo, of course, um, but it's a real pleasure to be here uh, virtually. Um, I'm just gonna start the slides going. Oops, now I've. And um, 
I don't want to make too strong a disclaimer, but I'm obviously feel myself an imposter uh, in some ways in, in this field. Um, but I have written a couple of articles on the travel process uh, itself. I've, I've tended to use travel literature as a source for wider social and, and cultural history. Um, but I, I wrote an article a, a few years ago um, on two female travelers in, in 1880s Norway, which was a contribution to a festschrift for my colleague uh, Birger Lovely in, in uh, Volda University College. And I was part of a project in Volda for, for many years, um, examining links between West Norway and Scotland. And um, that kind of leads us on, in a way, to the, to the talk, the subject uh, of my paper today. So I'll speak for about 20 minutes of uh, the trip that the Scottish doctor, Robert Wilson, uh, seen here in bust form, uh, made to Norway in 1830 and hopefully leave some time for questions. Uh, I'm going to give an overview rather than specific uh, specifics on, on methodology or, or so on, because I wasn't sure what people might find the most interesting. Uh, so I'm just going to raise a few issues that this uh, journal um, discusses. And just as some background uh, to the source, uh, when I was working at the University of Aberdeen, I was asked to write a very short text for a, a dagger that had formed a part of the Marshall Museum's collection. Uh, and the dagger had been presented to Robert Wilson uh, by a junior minister in Meldalen uh, in Trøndelag called Stang. Uh, and I found the travel journal that Wilson had made. And then I transcribed it uh, with a view either to publishing an edited or annotated volume. It was about 24,000 words. Um, or at least writing an article of some kind <laughs> about the themes that emerged from Wilson's observations of Norwegian society uh, in 1830. Uh, well, that was spring 2010, and um, about three months later, I ended up going to Finland, and everything changed research-wise uh, and so on. But uh, I'm really happy to have had this opportunity to get back to this. Like, 1830s Norway is a much happier place to be uh, in my mind than uh, 1860s Finland. So uh, thanks for uh, letting me come back to this. So this is Robert Wilson, uh, not in Norway, obviously, uh, but just for a small bit of background, uh, Wilson was born in the coastal town of Banff uh, in the northeast of Scotland in April uh, 1787. He attended Banff Grammar School before studying arts at Marshall College, uh, Aberdeen, and having attended some medical classes uh, in London and Edinburgh, um, he returned to Aberdeen and then graduated MD from King's College, Aberdeen, and then he made a small fortune through private trading whilst being a doctor on a ship uh, in the East India Company. Uh, so he was able to retire in 1814 at the age of 27 and then spent most of his time traveling around um, in the Near East, in Africa, Europe, uh, engaged in antiquarianism, archaeology, uh, excavating sites in Mesopotamia, uh, for example. He also promoted trade and, and the extension of Eastern trade routes. Um, but this is a, a nice quotation from early in his uh, Norwegian travel account. So he, he talks about how he's been to all of these other places in the world, uh, but his peregrin peregrinations in old Norway fill up a nook uh, in my remembrance, uh, which is often referred to for an agreeable detail of past pleasure. So he, he very much puts Norway up there with some of the great places in the world that he'd been to. But as far as I'm aware, he's never, nothing really has been published about this journal. Of course, it's been 10 years, so I'm, I'm, I was kind of worried that somebody today will say, well, yeah, I wrote a book about this uh, three years ago. Um, but uh, at the moment, I think uh, it's an untapped source. Um, I should also mention his travel companion, who, who was a man called Hans George Leslie of Dunlugas, or Dunluga, uh, who was born in Averoya in Christians, uh, well, in Christiansund uh, in 1786. He was the grandson of George Leslie uh, and the nephew of William Leslie. And George Leslie had been a fishing merchant in Banff in, in Scotland, uh, but he introduced a new method of um, fishing and set up in Christiansund. Uh, Sund. So um, the estate there at Bremsness uh, is where the, the Scottish family settled near Christian Sund. Uh, and this is where um, Wilson's travel companion uh, was born, although he lived uh, now in the northeast of Scotland, having inherited that estate. 
Um, it's also notable that uh, Don Lugas traveled everywhere in this Norwegian trip in the Highland costume, uh, especially seemed to have quite a short kilt, uh, which caused a lot of uh, interest and amusement and even embarrassment uh, from time to time. But if you think that 1830 is kind of the height of this tartan kilt craze, uh, Walter Scott inspired and so on. So it's maybe not that surprising. Now the journey to Norway uh, seems to have been relatively straightforward. Um, you can see the route they took here. The Scotsman made land uh, at uh, Bakusund, uh, just uh, south of Bergen, uh, in late June 1830. And from there they headed up the coast as far as Bremsnes and Kristiansund, and then to Trondheim. Um, there. And um, they used Trondheim as a base uh, for making short day trips, for example, to Lerfoss, uh, but also making a much longer trip around Trollheim. And um, he doesn't refer to Trollheim by name, but that's, that's where he went. Um, and then he was able to make a slightly deeper examination into, uh, let's say, the state of the peasantry, uh, looking at customs, uh, speaking to the clergy and local landowners, uh, and so on and they left in, uh, in August uh, back down to, to Leith. Um, I was looking around for a, a good map, and, and I, this has actually been on my wall for 10 years. It's the bus timetable from Bergen to Volda. Um, but this, had, uh, this actually, for my purposes today, was the most useful one I could find. So this is more or less where he traveled then uh, during the two months that he spent in and around Trondheim. So he went inland into this area of, of Trollheim and around around there. So that's the kind of overall context of, um, of the talk, uh, of the tour. So I thought I would just try and pick out a few of the people that he met and then some of the themes rather than just going through it like day by day or, or, or place by place. Um, because it seemed to me he met quite a lot of very interesting uh, people, let's say men, um, during this trip in 1830. Um, and so I thought I'd illustrate some of those, maybe showing the extent to which this type of upper or upper middle class British traveller was able to fit fairly seamlessly into these elite social circles. Um, I'll come on briefly to the journal's attitudes towards women uh, in, in the next section. So just for now, forgive me this wall of dudes that's about to appear um, that makes up uh, Wilson's um, main party friends and acquaintances. So there's Neil Schultz, uh, who at the time was the resident chaplain of uh, Vorfrühe uh, Church, um, as well as the head of uh, the Kungliga Norske Wiedenskapsselskap, which was based, is based in Trondheim. Um, Wilson said that he provided uh, much interesting information about the country and that Schultz understands English uh, perfectly and talks fluently. Another regular um, interlocutor and, and uh, somebody that Wilson visited regularly was Johann Toning Vidre uh, Uveson, who was born in Donegal, uh, and somebody Wilson refers to as a naturalized Irish man. So it's a very, for me, this is especially interesting, these kind of family and business links between the West of Ireland and, uh, and Norway at the time. And Wilson spent a lot of time with Overson, uh, often in the latter's grounds uh, on the banks of the River Nid uh, by Leerfoss. Um, and other travellers at, at this time, for example, Barrow, uh, also seem to enjoy spending time with Overson and, uh, while they're in Trondheim. And this is perhaps better reflected in Wilson's comment that uh, I found him a much more informed person than at first sight I had imagined. Uh, he was also most obliging and wanted to drive me all over the country. Uh, so you can see uh, Overson seems to be one of these uh, local uh, worthies who's really keen to meet the travelers and take them places uh, and so on. Uh, another man that uh, Wilson spent time with was Paul Hansen Beek. He was a high ranking military officer and at the time of Wilson's visit, the general war commissioner uh, and the head of the Trondheim infantry uh, Wilson enjoyed conversing with Birk in French uh, and noted that despite a painful war wound, the general partook largely of the festivities uh, during the dinner party in Trondheim. 
The highly decorated civil servant Grave Frederick Christopher von Trampe, uh, former governor of Iceland, uh, and when Wilson visited, he was the county governor of Sir Trundelag, um, and he, in fact, was Schultz's successor as head of the Royal Norwegian Society of, of Sciences and Letters. Uh, he made a very good impression on Wilson. He, he spoke English perfectly, it, it was said, and he seems also to have been very used to entertaining intrepid adventurers, both in Iceland and in Norway. Uh, and it seems to me that we're still seeing a Norway in this transition phase between uh, the Danish-Norwegian kingdom with this kind of stratified class system and the independent state, the peasant state that was much more popularized and, and idealized later in the 19th century. So uh, for me, this is why personally I found these encounters quite fascinating because my main research focuses has largely been on the late 19th century. Um, so getting into 1920s, 1930s, uh, Norway was, was very interesting. Wilson also made regular visits to Sibrude Lusholm Knudsen, another of Trondheim's wealthiest merchants, and again, quite the Anglophile. Uh, and I believe that his cousin, uh, Nikolai, ran Leslie's Klipfisk uh, concern in Bremsness when, when Leslie himself was over in, in Scotland. But Wilson also noted meetings with compatriots, either Scottish or, or British, uh, at these dinner parties, including James Dixon and his family, uh, who were notable merchants in Jötavoy and who were over in, um, in Trondheim uh, on business. But also there seems to be this kind of crisscrossing um, with other travellers. So uh, John Barrow, who, who wrote this excursions in the north of Europe in the 1830s, um, he, he had seen um, Wilson in the Holy Land, but had never managed to catch up with him. They see each other's names in, in visitor books and so on. So when Barrow knew that um, Wilson was in Trondheim, he actually made a point of going to, to visit him. And there's another allusion here um, that I, don't, I haven't been able to find yet. He said, I spent a few hours the next day with the Dixons, very agreeably, and afterwards with Mr. Coke who had traversed through part of Lapland and gave a curious account of those strange people uh, and with the scenery he met with. Indeed, he seemed a very intelligent young man just launched from Oxford, and I should have liked to have had more of his conversation. So I have the name Coke in green in my notes, and I, I'm not sure if I transcribed it correctly or, or it was you know, unclear, but I haven't actually been able to, you know, a lot of these accounts that fr from the north of Norway and. Uh, were published or you're you know they're not that hard to find sometimes but I haven't been able to uh, pinpoint uh, who Coke was uh, and I, I'm interested to find that. Before I go on to the themes I thought I'd just give you this is kind of what the the journal looks like so it's rather neat it wasn't the worst uh, transcription thing I've ever uh, done uh, I must say. Um, there's a few uh, strange uh, words from, you know, from 1830s English, but that, that wasn't too big of a problem. Uh, and I chose this particular page because he seems to have, um, I mean, this is basically a translation of Suna Noya, um, but uh, it's not quite right. <laughs> so um, I think at the dinner party, um, somebody just kind of jotted down, it, I mean, this had been the national anthem for about 10 years at this point. Um, so it's obviously a well-known song, but whether there was any kind of so-called official English translation, I, I, I'm not sure. But I presume one of his dinner companions has written, helped him translate it there and then. So I found this translation uh, also quite interesting. Uh, so just for the last seven minutes or so, um, I've, I've picked a few themes uh, from the journal uh, as he went around. The first one is, is sexual mores, and maybe this isn't so unusual at the time. And on more than one occasion, Wilson notes that illegitimate children uh, are more common than he had expected. Uh, and I've come across this before in Norwegian travel accounts, partly to do with the um, spending long hours on the, on the shieling in, in the mountainside, uh, and, and then nine months later, a baby pops up miraculously. Um, and for example, when he's in Meldalen, he, he says, uh, Opdalen and Sundalen are districts notoriously licentious. Uh, here it is somewhat better, uh, but still very low in the scale of virtue. It is a universal custom in Norway to court in bed. 
Um, he's also uh, disconcerted by the presence of an unblushing and seemingly indifferent maid who attending to him while undressing. Um, I was astonished at the nonchalance of the Norway maidens, one of whom remained in the room with me as I undressed. And being too sick to attend to the requisites of decorum, I left nothing undone previous to retiring. But on the other hand, uh, there seems to be some inconsistency in how women are presented uh, when responding to Dunlugas's short kilt. Uh, but the judgment is usually that the, the, the blame or the fault is on their part if they're shocked by the short kilt. That's, that's not the guy's fault, that's the women's fault. Uh, and if they are not shocked by it, they're also, <laughs> there's something wrong with them as well. So, more generally, uh, moral uh, commentary, uh, often regarding drink, uh, but only when the drinking is being done by either the peasantry or, in Wilson's words, uh, Laplanders. Uh, indeed, he notes that, I never use the word Laplander, so I hope you realise I'm quoting. Uh, One day in Trondheim, I encountered a small detachment of Laplanders, consisting of four men and three women, all very happy. These extraordinary people do all they can to sleep their senses in oblivion and drink brandy like water. They're slovenly attired, and water seldom seems to, uh, uh, greets their countenance. Uh, indeed, this easily acquired luxury is not held in much estimation in Norway. Uh, so people don't drink water when they could just eat, uh, drink brandy. Uh, and yet, Wilson's fulsome descriptions of the wide variety of alcohol that he and his friends consume uh, at the society dinners focus more on the quality of the drink and the length of the drinking sessions um, as poor, uh, you know, champagne, whiskey, uh, hock, etc. Uh, and when when he sang uh, Sonnet of Norga, for example, uh, it's after an almost continuous course of eating and drinking from four o'clock to 11. So he's very judgmental about people being drunk, but half the time he seems to be drunk uh, himself or causing other people to be drunk. Um, Again, slightly imposterish feeling here. This is just something I've worked on or been been edited. <laughs> but it's not, uh, you know, I, I've worked in this kind of field. It's one of those fields that I feel I know enough about to know that I know, don't know enough. Um, but there seems to be a, a thread of masculine adventure going through his, his narrative, hardship. Um, uh, he draws, um, I feel bad because we don't have nice photos from this. He does make line drawings of skylines, but even they are not particularly interesting. But he does describe the scenery very nicely. Um, he also needs to, remembering he's a doctor, he, he has a sore groin. So he says, I, I had to apply leeches to my groin and perineum uh, during the trip around Trollheim and, and nearly went home. Uh, but he just decided to grin and bear it. And then a few days later, I began to feel acute pain in the region where I had applied the leeches uh, and was so faint at times that I had a mind to halt. However, I resolved to repress my feelings as much as possible. So he's kind of giving this impression of quite a hard trip, uh, but he's, he's getting through it. Um, there's also an element of the, of the journey which would nowadays we might call a buddy road trip of some kind because he's with his old school pal, Leslie of Don Lugas. Um, they go fishing occasionally, but sport isn't such a big part of the of the narrative. Uh, and compared with the article I wrote on two female travellers in the 1880s, which is a different time and a different gender, uh, there's very little in the way they feel about each other or their emotions by the sea, from the scenery uh, and so on. It's, it's quite matter of fact. Uh, although he does mention Don Lugas being emotional when he sees the place where he was born uh, in Christiansund and meeting old relatives and so on. Women, uh, yes, he seems to like women but doesn't really give them agency, uh, whether a East India Company doctor in the 1820s, 1830s would be giving women much agency, I'm, I'm not sure but it is quite noticeable that almost every woman he meets, he makes some kind of judgment based on their manners or their looks and, and quite often uh, positive uh, for sure. <laughs> uh, but they are usually just their husband's wife or uh, their father's daughters or, or things like this. Um, or, or they look like some woman he knew from Aberdeen, like this, this kind of thing. Um, she is an uncommonly good looking woman uh, he refers to the wife of, of Captain Holterman uh, in Erkedalen. 
um, and, and, and things like this. I have more examples. The peasantry, um, he perceives as being extremely stupid, uh, badly, uh, badly educated, and this reflects badly on Norway uh, in general and, and kind of hinders Norway's development as an intellectual society. Uh, but he does praise their um, handiwork, uh, like their um, silver, like the silver ornaments on their national costumes and, and things like this. And he loves the parties and, and the, you know, the, the songs and, and the, the elements of folk culture. Um, but if you compare how the peasantry becomes maybe more idealized later in the century and maybe even later in the decade, uh, if you read Samuel Lang's book, um, there, there's some kind of, I have kind of vague idea that we're in a kind of turning point uh, period about the, the perception of the Norwegian peasantry, uh, but maybe I'm reading too much into, into one uh, source. Yeah, and just also um, when Toril was was writing uh, was was speaking uh, ten minutes ago, um, there's quite a few comments about how bad the roads are and why do they put this road over the top of this mountain when it could just go around the side, uh, <laughs> like this. Um, so he does he mentions the the industry, the copper copper mines, the um, the sawmills. Sometimes there's a there's a, a kind of um, contradiction between what he hopes to see, in the sense of unspoiled scenery uh, kind of jostling with position for modern modernity and, and industry. Um, so I found that quite interesting uh, as well. And just finally, um, he, he having this antiquarian background, he, he makes a lot of observations about tumuli and, and swords that have been found and Norse uh, findings. Um, while he's in Trondheim, he mentions the burning of Lisbeth Nupon uh, in, in 1670 and compares that with, with Scotland where they were burning witches much, much later in his own. So he's trying to say, don't be judgmental against Norway for burning uh, what he called um, a barbarous war against old women. Um, but he also mentions, for example, he was in Bergen. Uh, he describes Bergen very well, but it was only a few months after the, the Great Fire in 1830. So he's there are some little observations about this, which are like time signals, which is quite nice. Uh, and he also mentions uh, something that I remember very well from my time in Boulder, the, the um, Kringen, the Battle of Kringen and, and the Sinclair um, uh, massacre of, of the Scots there. Uh, so uh, he's well aware of that. So that's, that's my overview um, of what I think is a very interesting manuscript source of around about 24,000 uh, words. Um, I just thought I'd present it like that and, and see if anybody had any more specific questions. My own personal feeling is this would go really well as a, as a comparison with Samuel Lang's uh, account from the 1930s. But it, of course, they're not quite comparable in the sense that Lang was three years uh, in, in Norway. But I think they have quite different uh, impressions of Norway. So, But thanks again for letting me get back to this after 10 years. Thank you very much for that, Andrew. That was very exciting. Um, I already have one question on my list from Ulrike, so please go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Andy. And I think it's so fascinating uh, when you analyze uh, one travel report uh, from the early 1800s because it, you know, it shows you so well what kind of uh, uh, discussions, discourses, uh, topics were uh, important that time. But I also wondered if you could um, uh, say something or if you have found anything in this journal about um, uh, other travelers. Um, I, I just thought of Mary Wollstonecraft which, and her, her journal was published in I think 1796 or something like this. Yeah. So and um, and she has different view, for example, on the peasantry, on the Norwegian peasantry. So um, th there's something I wonder whether you found anything about it, about that. And uh, the other thing, uh, it's just a tiny question, but is how was he introduced to all the people? So how did he establish his network? Did he get introductory letters, which he brought along? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, um, my impression is uh, on the first question, uh, yes, he meets other travelers, uh, but there's no indication he, that he's cross-referencing these. 
Um, so I wrote the, uh, this other article I've alluded to is about two female travelers in the 1880s. And they, for example, specifically allude to um, the, the well-known book Tre Noia by, by one of them. Uh, and, and then the, uh, the other one, The Unaccompanied Females. Uh, from which uh, the quotation that uh, like a woman doesn't need a man except for carrying luggage and, and we always remember not to bring any luggage or like this so the, the two women in the 1880s in the article I wrote are very aware of other writing uh, but my impression is that Wilson is coming to this from the point of view of being a traveler in other countries rather than somebody who's specifically focused on Norden or, or on, on the Nordic region and I don't know uh, whether he has made too much effort to read up beforehand some of these other accounts. There's no real evidence of that. Um, and my feeling is, is, is very much that he is um, introduced to people by Don Lugas, his, um, his good friend who, um, who is from Christian Sund and, and seems to know everybody in Trondheim. Um, when, uh, when they arrive in Bergen, he meets Grieg, uh, the, the, I think he's the Dutch consul general at the time, but he's the grandson or grandfather, I, uh, who is he? He's related to the composer Grieg, <laughs> um, but the Griegs were well known and, and he makes a comment that once you get to know this guy, then all the doors are open for you. Um, so I think it is, I think there's also a certain amount of English, uh, he's Scottish, but he has this kind of um, British sort of upper class bluster where he just is very confident and goes into places and, and says I'm hello I'm a traveler from Britain uh, please show me your museum uh, this, this kind of thing. Thank you. I think I have a comment perhaps from Martina, uh, but yeah, here we go. Just a minute, please. Yep. Yep. Um, because yeah, Martina, she tells me that she has a bad microphone. So I was asked to read um, aloud her comment. Um, okay. So I'm yeah, <laughs> here, this is Martina. Thank you for this presentation and just a short and possibly funny slash creative anecdotal musing. That's How in That's what you want. How interesting you start the presentation with the bust of Robert Wilson in stone to then go on talking about all the travels and freedom of movement he experienced in his lifetime, among other places in and around the, the, um, the very Trollheim. Um, in Scandinavian folklore, the worst possible thing that could happen to a troll was being exposed to sunlight and turning into stone which means a full stop to any further active movement, which brings me, sorry, um, which brings me back to t the talk on Knut Knutsonson's photography and the production of the pictures by exposure of the negatives in his dark room, which made the road physically enabling movement. So static forever by capturing it on a piece of paper. Well, looks like Wilson himself turned into a stone bust. <laughs> That's a great, uh, it's a nice way of linking the two uh, papers together as well, thanks. Um, yeah, he's unfortunately, um, you would kind of think there were more uh, portraits about him around, but I, I haven't really come across many. Um, I, I've been I've been stopped by COVID from, uh, I've kind of got this, again, dilettante interest. I found another photographic archive now in the Royal Society of Surgeons in Glasgow. Um, so uh, I just, but I haven't been able to get there now. So this was a different doctor who retired and then spent the rest of his life fishing in Norway and Finland and Ireland and so on. So, but he's left a load of photos. So uh, I can, I can talk to some of you about that maybe in the future. But uh, yeah, apologies not for having particularly interesting uh, images. Thanks. Thank you so much. And that was very interesting also without images. So don't worry about that. <laughs> okay, it's time for our um, break. I want to thank all of the three speakers for this session. And uh, at two o'clock, the next session begins with Kjersti Balen, Ellen Mortensen. So please be back a couple of minutes before two. So um, we will see each other then. Thank you.
Well, welcome back and uh, good afternoon. We are going to have four papers now in the afternoon. And uh, we start our first paper in this session with uh, Shasti Vale. Uh, Shasti is a scholar of comparative literature at the University of Oslo. And in her research, uh, she has um, mainly been interested in melancholy and related feelings, emotions and moods. Shasti has published extensively on these topics. And uh, I think that probably many of us know her work on uh, aesthetics. And here I want particularly uh, point uh, your attraction, uh, your interest to the book Aesthetic and Inferring, which was published in uh, 2009. And Shasti will now talk about traveling about contemporary wounds, essayistic self-fashioning in Marit Eikemo's Samtits. Ruina. Very happy to have you here, Shasti, and please, the screen is yours. Thank you so much, Ulrike, for your kind introduction. On the opening page of Marit Eikemo's essay collection, Contemporary Ruins, she represents herself in her car driving through Hardanger on her way home to Odda, the town where she was born and grew up. Odda is well known for its melting plant, once the world's biggest manufacturer of carbide, which went bankrupt in 2003. Uh, contrasts uh, such as the juxtaposition of the scenic route through Hardanger and the decaying smelting plant in Odda is a characteristic feature of Eikimo's essays. Sometimes they turn out to be paradoxes. As she drives towards Edda, Odda, Aikimo is singing Rupert's rain rights going to a town at the top of her voice. Quote, I got a life to lead, I got a soul to feed, I got a dream to heed, quote, end of quote. Yet the part of Wainwright's song that her journey resonates with begins as follows. I'm going to a town that has already been burnt down. I'm going to a place that has already been disgraced. I'm going to see some folks who have already been let down. According to Aikimo, the town alluded to here is Dublin, but in her mind, the town is Odda. Because Odda is already depicted by other writers, among them Frode Gritten, she can never write about Odda, she says. This is just a stubborn, stubborn attempt, she claims. By using the expression attempt here, she hints at the essay genre as the word essay derives from the French infinitive essayer, to try or to attempt. Contemporary ruins can thus be categorized as travel essays. This is emphasized as both the journey into Odda and writing as attempt are thematized on the opening pages of the collection. In his study of the essay as a literary form, Graham Good distinguishes between the travel book which typically covers a journey, perhaps over an entire country, region, or continent, and the travel essay, which tends to concentrate on a place. To illust illustrate his point, he chooses travel essays by Henry James, which he describes as follows. Quote, in his, that is Henry James's, best travel essays, there is a convergence between place and self, expression and impression, the passive surrender to the environment and the active conscious quest for what will be for him its symbol, its essence. End of quote. The very same can be said about Marit Eikebo's best travel essays. In what follows, I will explore how this exchange between self and ruin is realized. Contemporary Ruins was first published in 2008. The book consists of 11 essays, each concentrated, consecrated to a contemporary ruin in Norway, except for one from Torre Vieja in Spain. 
An official estimate suggests that there are more than 20,000 Norwegians living in Costa Bianca, so it doesn't come as a surprise that the Park de la Relajación in Torre Vieja is included among Norwegian ruins. The journey starts and ends in Odda, where Eikemo visits the ruins of Odda's melting plant and the Solfon Hotel. In the same region, she also goes to the graveyard of the psychiatric hospital Valen. She inspects discarded slot machines in Arna and the reception center for asylum seekers in Lustig. Furthermore, she visits a fish meal factory in Stansund in the northern part of Norway. In the eastern part, she goes to a shopping center in Stovner, whose roof collapsed some years ago, a closed down military camp, Eggemon, and the ski jump Skuibakken. And she goes to the Ecofisk platform in the North Sea. The ruins indicate the coordinates of Eikemo's mapping and contemporary Norwegian culture and its recent history. On her way to Stamsun, Eikemo pulls up her car to experience Dan Graham's installation without title. It consists of walls of glass and is therefore nicknamed the shower cubicle by the locals. Even though she's fed up by local art galleries, she doesn't want to miss out on this sculpture, which catches the surrounding nature within itself. Standing in front of the artwork, she sees her own reflection and the landscape behind her. She moves around, and with her face turned towards the fjord, she realizes the obvious. Quote, I'm not in nature. I turned towards the glass wall again, and there I was. I turned towards the nature again, it was gone. I looked down at my hands, yet I'm here. I turned towards the picture in the glass wall and was answered, yes, it's me. I'm in the picture, I'm in art. When I moved to the right, the sculpture caught another aspect of nature. I influenced the artwork. It makes a difference that I'm here, I thought. End of quote. Aikimo discovers that whereas nature remains the same, whether she's in it or not, the situation is exactly the opposite when it comes to art. The sculpture changes contingent on her being part of it or not. She influences the sculpture, she makes a difference. But it is also the other way around. The sculpture has an emotional impact on her. When she enters the car and leaves, she's in high spirits. This reciprocity between Graham's sculpture and Eikmo can be regarded as an emblem or a mise en abime of her encounters with contemporary ruins on her journey. Just as Graham's sculpture, they reveal what Good points out as an implicit concept of culture in James's Venice essay. It consists of the peculiar accommodation reached between a given physical setting and the life it contains, perceived through the evolving history of that relationship, evident in buildings, gardens, ruins, and so on. In what follows, I will investigate a couple of Aikimo's essays to show how they consist of such accommodations. I start with the first essay, The Odda Process, which I've already mentioned its first page, and argue that this essay introduces a recurrent pattern in the book. The pattern connects first a contemporary ruin that in some way or another is closed to the public or at least fenced off. Second, a gatekeeper who helps Aikimo to enter the ruin. Third, some kind of experience implicating that Aikimo's defenses are lowered, which in turn makes her, fourth, attuned to apprehend some kind of vulnerability or precarity, signaled by a quote from, from or reference to a piece of art or popular music. When I use the term attunement, I'm inspired by the British author Sadie Smith's essay, Some Notes on Attunement, in which she describes attunement as an experience of getting into a state of lower defenses, a readiness to accept absurdity or a change of taste, 
by way of mediation through remembrance of a work of art which may express exactly the opposite of how you remember it. In the other process, the confined area is that of oven number three, which is a prohibited area of the former smelting plant. Eikemo enters the ruin illegally with the help of a former worker at the plant, Terje Kolbotten. He tries hard to submit nomination proposal of the oven for the UNESCO list, arguing that also the ugly parts of the smelting plant deserve to be on that list. The expression, the ugly parts, is not primarily an aesthetic evaluation. It alludes just as much to the truth about how the smelting plant, according to Colbotten, was plundered by the corporate executives and sold off to foreign companies. Thus, once again a line from Rufus Wainwright's song resonates with the situation. I'm so tired of America, they never really seem to want to tell the truth, she sings. I'm so tired of this journey, Aikimo thinks, echoing Wainwright's song as she drives through Hardanger on her way to Odda. When she asks Kolbotten if he's afraid of being taken to court for trespassing, he answers that it would be a pleasure to tell the truth about the smelting plant in court. The intertextuality with going to town seems to implicate that Aikimo is on his side. While following Kolbotten into the control room, Aikimo's thoughts wander to the previous night when she went to a reunion party with her former classmates. She flashbacks to a story she was told. The farm where they are throwing the party was once a horrible crime scene. Two elderly siblings, Samson and Suniva, who lived on this farm in the woods, were brutally beaten by muggers. Suniva died because of the injuries. Samson was able to get out from the house and was later found in a puddle of blood more dead than alive, by the very same Terje Kolbotten, Eikemo's guide. The story is shocking, and Eikemo comments, quote, terrible things happen all the time, when you least expect it, when you think you are safe, end of quote. Her thoughts wander again, and she remembers another time she came home to Odda, and the noise from the plant was quieted, the oven cold, and 100 years of industry history were over. 140 workers had lost their jobs, as did the rest when the plant went bankrupt the following year. Leaving through the gate, workers were searched by guards. Some of them had been working at the plant for 40 years. This is a harsh irony on the backdrop of Colbotton's description of what he calls the pillaging of the plant. It was dismantled, and sold in parts to China, Germany and Pakistan respect respectively. The German firm thereby became exclusive provider of hydrogen cyanamed on the world market and the price increased by 50%. Aikimo also describes how minutes of meetings concerning unfortunate events, as well as personal information about former workers, are negligently spread all over the place in the control room as if those in charge did not care. Aikimo's apprehension of the workers' precarity is signaled by a quote from a popular song by Chet Baker, It Could Happen to You. The song becomes a refrain throughout the essay. It Could Happen to You is about falling in love when you least expect it, but for Aikimo, it bridges her memories of two different but devastating incidents. The quadrangulation of motives I found in the Oda process is more or less to be found in the probably most thought-provoking of the essays as well. It's called No Title on the Grave. In the Oda process, the lowering of Aikimo's defenses and the ensuing attunement depended on her having a hangover after the union, reunion party the day before. In No Title on the Grave, the lower defenses are already there as the essay opens. Aikimo has, go, has got herself lost while looking for an old churchyard in the woods. 
She's been there before and remembers vaguely how it looked like, but cannot find it on her own. A feeling of being lost is accompanied by her memory of Ben Sorensen's musical composition, Deserted Churchyards. In this essay, the gatekeeper is the lady at the local grocery store. She indicates the way to the ruin in question, the fenced off churchyard of the psychiatric hospital Valden. Upon entering the churchyard, Aikimo is overwhelmed by an unidentifiable, unidentifiable feeling. Instinctively, she puts her hand over her mouth and cannot tell whether it is because she wants to scream or because she's feeling nauseated. Her heart jumps and she passes through the gate. The graveyard is where the dead patients from Wallen were buried. The gravestones are almost overgrown. Among them, Eikemo finds the gravestone of the former chief physician, Konrad Lunde, and his wife, which initiates memories that disclose a paradox involving the brutal insight into the vulnerability of the patients at Wallen. Konrad Lunde and his wife's Borghild's gravestone is as, is as simple as the other gravestones in the graveyard. There is no title on the grave. He wanted it that way. Hence, it does not show that he was one of the strongest heads of hospital in Norway after the war. Lunde's philosophy was that pills, syringes, operations and shock treatment were only secondary. The main cure was to make the patients feel useful. So they were set to work, such as knitting or hand sorting fruit. On the other hand, Lunde was a strong defender of lobotomy, which was extensively used at Valm. Yes, 175 and 185 women were lobotomized at Valm during the years 1949 to 1955. Some patients recovered and functioned better than before but most of them became lethargic and experienced lasting negative effects from the procedure. As the only country in Scandinavia, Norway introduced the transorbital lobotomy. This was an operation performed by forcing an ice pick through the bony orbit at the back of the eye socket, manipulated by the surgeon's hand to destroy the neuronal tracts in the brain that were thought to give rise to mental illness. As compared to the standard procedure, transorbital lobotomy was considered to be both more efficient and cheaper. Time, as well as money, was saved when the method was used. The poet Olav H. Hauge was six times subject to involuntary commitment into Valm. His health record shows that he was seriously ill. It is rather uncommon that a patient as ill as Hauge recovers. During one of his most severe attacks, Konrad Lunde took the initiative to have his debut collection of poems published. Hauge himself wanted to burn the manuscript, whereas Lunde meant it would be beneficial for Hauge's mental health to have the poems published. He even reviewed the collection in the newspapers Bergens Tidne and Dagen. In contrast to the story about Olav H. Hauge, Aikimo also tells about a teenage girl subject to involuntary commitment into Gausta, the biggest psychiatric hospital in Norway. The girl was a Roma, a traveler. Only 17 years old, she was castrated, even though her health record states that she disapproved of the castration and said she was forced to it through shock treatment. They also state that according to the chief surgeon, Despite the operation, she was still malicious, gossipy, and vain. Furthermore, she tried to escape several times, and she was suicidal. After a, while, after a while, the girl was diagnosed with mental illness and lobotomized. Nevertheless, she was reported to still cause trouble for the staff by her whining and cursing. As a result, she was isolated and lobotomized once more. Almost immediately, she died from hemorrhaging. What were the opportunities for this girl, asks Aikimo. Would she have had a chance if she were not a Roma, if she were a boy, if she at least were not chasing boys, or if she'd had a great talent? What's, what if she'd come to Valen 
and Conrad Lunde had seen this talent. The two stories reveal a paradox. The most horrifying treatment of gravely ill people who cannot defend themselves and the humane attitude towards the same group of people can exist in the very same system at the same time. The two examples about the teenage Roma girl and the talented male poet respectively point to vulnerability as a common human denominator. But the risk it entails is not evenly distributed. Hence, the right to travel, which is a human right, was not given to Jens Christian, a patient at Valen, who refused to open his eyes until he could go home. A series of electron, electroconvulsive therapy treatments made it impossible for him to keep his eyes shut. Eventually, he was lobotomized. The attunement Aikimo experiences makes her lower her defenses and thereby apprehend the vulnerability and precarity of people like Samson and Sunima, Hauge and the teenage girl. As I see it, this can be articulated through a set of intersecting concepts discussed by Judith Butler, precariousness and precarity. Precariousness is the general, pervasive and ontological condition of vulnerability. This is what the stories about Samson and Suneva, as well as Hauge, exemplify. Precarity, on the other hand, designates that politically induced condition in which certain populations suffer from failing social and economic networks of support and become differentially exposed to injury, violence and death. This is what affected the Roma girl. But what about the workers at Odda's melting plant who lost their jobs? Do they exemplify precariousness or precarity? That depends on the eyes of the beholder. I think that what Terje Kolbotten calls the ugly truth and wants to speak out about in court is their precarity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shasti. Um, I think uh, what you did, uh, um, first of all, I have to say that it was really beautifully linked, even though you couldn't know this, but to our discussion in the mornings about culture, nature distinction, about the role of technology. And but you, what you also showed uh, is uh, the relevance of uh, travel narratives as, uh, as a source to understand political and social issues today and in history. So thank you very much. Um, are there, yeah, are there any questions? Um, yes, uh, Jakob, please. Uh, thank you very much. Um, fascinating paper. Um, are so many questions. Um, just ask one of them. Um, Konrad Lunde. Mm -hmm. um, he must have been a remarkable character, uh, both as, uh, as a medical doctor, but also as, as a human being. I'm just wondering, I know this may sound a bit strange because it is so, so much easier for us with, with the advantage of hindsight to, to question lobotomy as, as a method. Um, I, I suppose you would agree that he, he didn't want to harm his patients, he wanted to cure them. Mm. What I don't understand is this kind of distance or even gap between his insight, um, helping uh, Hauge um, on his way to becoming a major Norwegian, even international poet, uh, on the one hand, I mean, the fact that, that which, which I didn't know that he even reviewed his yeah. The collection in Bergen Stiegler, that is, that is unbelievable, really. So that, that kind of insight on, on one sort of side of the spectrum, and then on the other, this kind of this belief in, in this technique, which, which did so much harm, uh, even though it helped perhaps some, most of the patients, uh, as you said, were, were, were not cured, uh, far from it. Uh, how can, how would you explain this kind of this kind of gap or this kind of discrepancy between what he could see or di and did do and what he failed to, failed to see? Um, 
I would say it is a paradox, but on the other hand, uh, I think that he was working with severely ill persons. So he, and his, his, uh, he's known for his, uh, for his uh, humanity in, in, uh, in trying to, to treat them. Uh, but I think that uh, lobotomy, as, it's important to, to say that Hauge has his most severe attacks before lobotomy was introduced at Valm. Okay. So he was most, uh, he was, he was at his uh, most ill during the 30s and into the beginning of the 40s and, and lobotomy didn't start until the end of the 40s in 49, I think, at, uh, at Valm. So that, that explains some of it, but, but I think that uh, he probably was helpless in, in front of some of the most severely ill people. And therefore when this cure came and it gave some hope of, uh, of how to, to cure people, that this was what they scientifically believed in at the time. So I think it's, uh, I think it's hard to condemn him, but I think that it's very interesting that Marit Aikimo uh, draws attention to the to the paradox. Yeah, mm. but yes. I, I can't I can't explain it. But I, no, I think I, no, I suppose we we cannot we can't probably as it. you said it has to do with no it's probably has to do the it's probably just in in hindsight that we can see what uh, lobotomy actually did to people. In the beginning, they must have thought that this was a revolutionary cure who really could help those. Yeah, yes. Who, yeah, yes. those badly affected. Mm. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have time for one more question. Yes, I think there's a question. <laughs> I'll try to be brief. Thank you for a very interesting paper, Kerstin. Um, since uh, uh, the theme of the conference is, is travel or Nordic travel and, um, and Akimo's travels happen at different sites in Norway, is there a way in which she talks about being attuned to the, these different sites and where these kinds of ruins are, are um, uh, appearing uh, in different uh, ways? Do we see that there is a change in her, her own travel experience? I mean, can you see some kind of um, voicing of precariousness or even precarity as a, as a sort of a political social reflection on what is happening uh, as, as regards her own experience as, as a traveler? Oh, that's an interesting question. And I must admit, I'm, I'm not quite sure. Um, I, I don't think there's much development from one essay to another as to her reflections on her own precarity and her own precariousness. Uh, but actually, I think she, she comes, uh, her insight is, is, um, is deepened during the essays, but I don't think Oh, I have to look into it, but but I think her, her self reflections on on her own precarity and precariousness is is not that explicit at least, and and uh, and her attunement is is not made ex that I think it's it's maybe it's um it's a it's a characteristic trait of how she writes that very much is said is said implicitly. So the attunement is something that uh, I took from Zadie Smith to to do to to pin down what is exactly is the coordinates in her experience. Thank you. Thank you again, Shasti. And uh, we continue actually right away with Ellen uh, Mortensen. And um, Ellen is a School of Comparative Literature at the University of Bergen. And she has published extensively on feminism, gender theory, literature and philosophy 
and also Anglo-American, French and Scandinavian literature. And um, I just, uh, it's a long list, so I just want to name uh, a few uh, writers and theorists she has written about, um, such as uh, Judith Butler, Luz Irigaray, Martin Heidegger, and Virginia Woolf, Henrik Ibsen, and Knut Hamsom. And uh, what she is going to talk about today is yet another writer, and it is on uh, transatlantic travels in stories and letters, Edward Holmes' Norwegian American Family Chronicle. Ever since his breakthrough uh, with the innovative novel, uh, The Ferry Crossing from 1974, Edward Holmes has remained one of Norway's leading writers. He's published over 50 works to date, including novels, dramas, poetry, translations, and biographies. Above all, his four-volume biography on Björnstjerne Björnsson. Huam is also an outspoken intellectual who's positioned himself on the far left in the Norwegian political and cultural debate. Among his last publications is his own family chronicle, which covers a period from the 1880s to 1960s in a four volume series written between 2014 and 2017. Um, they were published as four different volumes. Uh, these are the two first, here are the two seconds. <clears throat> um, and it's based on the story of his own great grandfather, Knut Hansen Nasha, his wife, Serianna, and their descendants. Um, here is Edward Huem, uh, himself in front of this family uh, farm uh, in uh, in Reknesliya outside uh, Bo Molda. The family saga, which counts over 1,700 pages, has become a bestseller in Norway. The first, the first volume, Slottikar i Himmelen, uh, in English, Haymaker in Heaven, is in the process of being translated into English and is announced to be published this coming fall and most probably translations of the other volumes will follow soon. Knut Hans Nesha, or Nesha as he's commonly called, and his family lived on a small tenant homestead on the outskirts of Molde. And uh, here's a map of Norway marking uh, Molde. Uh, located on the western coast of Norway. In this novel, and here's the view from Reknesliya, just about uh, to the vista in uh, Molde, uh, Huam retraces the turbulent lives of his relatives both in Norway and in the US and in Canada, among others, Nesha and Serianna's son Eilert, Eilert uh, Knutsen Nesha, and here's a family portrait of them, and Eilert is here to the right in the back, as well as Seriam's uh, sister, uh, Yatina Oz, and her family, who crossed the Atlantic to settle in North America in the 1880s. Let me see, let me go back, I'm sorry about this. At this time in history, almost a third of the Norwegian population left Norway to venture life in the New World. Hoem thus chronicles the trials and triumphs of these historical individuals who left the motherland and those who remained. Hoem uh, recounts not only the Norwegian history during this his historical period, which traverses two world wars, but also that of the Norwegian immigrant settlements in North America. In so doing, he gives a rich and detailed account of the transatlantic exchanges that took place between the two continents. This was a time marked by great transition from predominantly agrarian rural societies into industrialized ones on both sides of the continent. Who delves into the radical social and political changes that these societies underwent as well as the emotional and spiritual challenges that they encountered, be they individual or collective. Powerful characters, such as Nesha, Serianna, Eilert, Anton Edvard, Anton Edvard is the young one in front, and Yatina emerge in these novels. Their individual lives are all marked, sometimes violently, by the fluctuating times, be they caused by economic crisis, 
natural disasters, social, political, or religious movements, or emotional upheavals. In this study, I will focus on the theme of travel and the traversing of frontiers as they relate to the family of Norwegians, be they placed in Norway or transposed to the North American prairie. The theme will be elucidated primarily through the study of a handful of characters as they are depicted in Hoem's poetic and affective prose. Hoem's Family Chronicle is a hybrid text that operates between conventional history writing, biography, letter writing, and realist fiction. The author has done extensive historical research in the process of writing these books, which are rich in detail about the material conditions that determine the lives of the characters on both sides of the continent. The novel series thus offers an in-depth account of the living conditions in Norway, the US, and Canada, at a particular challenges that these characters met in their respective local settings. As such, the novels have a considerable historical value. However, at the same time, the writer takes liberties by fictionalizing the narrative, thus allowing him to enter into the thoughts and feelings of each character and thereby giving them life as complex and distinct personalities. In Scandinavia, there's a debate taking place these days concerning reality literature or Wirklietslitteratur, especially in the wake of Carlo Wegnerskor's novel series, My Struggle. Much of the debate is centered on the problems connected to what is called autofiction and how this form of literature should be received and read. The question concerning the truth value of the narrative is at the center of the debate, given that the perspective of the narrative is necessarily subjective. To what extent should the author or narrator be held ethically accountable for the content of the novels? By which parameters should the text be interpreted and judged? Frode Helmik Pedersen, an active participant in the debate in Norway, proposes in his article on reality literature the following definition of the term. Quote, reality literature refers to fictional works that seem to reflect reality in such a way that recognizable factual persons appear in the work in events that have actually occurred. These events have a tendency to be private rather than public, my translation. In certain respects, Huem's family chronicle fits the definition of reality literature, given the fact that Edward Huem is the author as well as the narrator of the novel series on his own family history. Hence, he's subjectively implicated in the narrative, given that he actually figures in the saga as a living character, namely as the great grandson of the paterfamilia Knut Nesha, and who emerges as a character in the fourth and last volume. However, as opposed to Knauskor in my struggle, Hoem's role as a narrator and character in the novels is rather marginal compared to Knauskor. He creates a predominantly third person narrative and remains for the most part fairly distant as a non-manifest narrator. According to his own afterward, to the first, first volume, Haymaker in Heaven, he is implicated and invested in the story, but primarily as a listener, researcher, and observer. Uh, quote, um, both Haymaker in Heaven and the second volume, Your Brother on the Prairie, are fictional novels, which, it should be noted, are based on real histories and fictions of persons that have lived. I first learned about these relatives from my father, who told me about them throughout my childhood. He talked of my great-grandfather, Knut Nesja, as a man who had four sons and a daughter, I might add, but who in different ways lost them all. Two of them, Eilert and Bastian Georg, he would never see again after they left the country. Eilert when he was 16 and a half years old, Georg Bastian when he was 23." End quote. And this was my translation as well. Huem speaks of the method that he has pursued in writing the books, which first and foremost implies interviewing people with knowledge about local history and his family history on both sides of the Atlantic. These informants helped him secure accuracy in his descriptions of actual people and places. And in addition to family anecdotes and letters, he admits to using a number of historical as well as fictional works in order to, quote, provide the most truthful representation possible of the times and conditions together with extensive studies of farming on the prairie, bird life, wildlife, as well as the life 
lives of humans, end quote. There are obvious fictional precursors to Holmes' narrative, the most apparent one being Ole E. Rölvog's Giants in the Earth from 1924 and 25, and Wilhelm Mubad's tetralogy, The Emigrants, that appeared uh, between 1949 and 1959. They also made a television series, a film of these books that was, were sent in the 70s, I think, in Norway. These works were widely read in Norway and form part of the aesthetic and historical material that Holm also draws from in his own account on Norwegian lives on the prairie in North America. By taking liberties as a writer in his use of historical documentation, above all by combining these historical facts with information that he gathers from fictional works and by fictionalizing the characters, Holm could be accused of falsifying history. That is always a peril, but at the same time, transgressing the traditional norms for historical accounts and family chronicles allows Huem to make a large rate, to make use of a large register of genres and aesthetic devices in his portrayal of people and places. This adds both lyricism and pathos to the narrative in contrast to the sober style traditionally used in historical texts. It is this very aesthetic dimension of Holm's narrative that makes these 1700 pages enticing to read and which in the last instance contributes to the apparent literary quality of the narrative. Three of the most compelling characters in the family saga are Eilert, <clears throat> Nesha and Seriana's second older son, Anton Edward, the youngest son, and Seriana's sister, Yatina Os. As readers, we follow the story of their lives, which span the whole of the four volumes. Hoem presents a gripping account of the hardships and achievements that they experience. In the course of their journey, Yatina and Eilet not only traversed many geographical frontiers, but experienced also spiritual and mental struggles that proved perhaps to be as challenging to them as their material struggles. At home in Norway, Nash's youngest son, Edward, Anton Edward, lived through perhaps the most radical journey of them all, when he at the age of 10 was given away to his childless uncle and his wife in Frana. Even though his journey only takes him from Molde to Frana, his abrupt separation from his loving parents only to be transplanted to his stern relatives in the neighboring country marks him for life. It is above all through the story of Anton Edward and his descendants, and among them, the author himself, who's the grandson of Anton Edward, that the reader gains insight into the state of affairs in Norway in this historical period. The letters that travel between Anton Edward and his brother Eilert in America provides not only Anton Edward with much information about immigrant life in North America, but likewise the reader. For most Norwegians at this time, letters were the most important source of information they received about life in the new world. As news of lucrative aspect, prospects in America from the first immigrants reached the shores of Norway in the latter part of the 1800s, people started scrutinizing their current living situations, which for many were fraught with poverty and hardship. One of the first to be nourished by high hopes of a better life in America was the young and feisty Yatina, Seriana's younger sister. Having found God through a layman's Christian movement in Norway at a young age, Yatina became infamous for publicly challenging the Lutheran priest in her parish, arguing for an alternative theological interpretation of the Bible. Yatina's fearless opposition to authority speaks of an exceptional courage, but also of a tendency to challenge and transgress boundaries or limits. These character traits will prove equally to serve her and, and to harm her in a future life in America. Her independent and adventurous nature sets her apart from most of her peers and, in many, and may in part explain why she and her husband were among the first from the area to emigrate to America. Her passionate 
approach to love is similar to her religious fervor. The seduction scene where the saddle maker Ula on their wedding night finally succeeds in, amor in his amorous advances is witnessed by Yatina's brother Ula and can be heard from far away. Quote, this is my translation. He heard such cries of delight from the loft that they pierced through marrow and bone and it was beyond doubt Yatina who cried out dazed with happiness and fulfillment, end quote. Yatina is a dynamic agency, is the dynamic agency behind their move across the, uh, the Atlantic by writing to Ule's relatives who have already emigrated to America. She convinces her reluctant husband to break up their life in Norway and she orders the tickets for them. Ule and the pregnant Yatina travel together with their two small children and first arrive in Canada on June 17, 1886 after a three week sea crossing. And this is the ship, the kind of ship that many of them uh, traverse the Atlantic with. After this journey, they still had a long way to go by boat, train and horse carriage before they finally arrived in Rossland North. That's wrong, it's South Dakota. South Dakota. And uh, Roslyn, South Dakota is located right on the uh, border between Minnesota and South Dakota. During the first month of arri after arrival, they are forced to live with their relatives on the prairie and serve as farmhand for Ulus brother Hans Ors, a situation which does not sit well with Ulla, who has been an independent craftsman all his adult life. He wants to set up shop as saddle maker, but in the new ways of farming in the area, machines are in demand, not craftsmanship. Saddles are industrially produced for a fraction of the cost of making them by hand. Consequently, there's not much need for saddle makers in their new home, and Ulla decides instead to pursue hunting and trapping in the area to try to eke out an income in addition to their farming. Ulla and Yatina <clears throat> decide to buy 320 acres of land in Sisseton in a small Scandinavian settlement in Roberts County, South Dakota. However, Yatina is for the most part left alone tending for their children and keeping the farm afloat while her husband is away hunting and trapping. Isolation, loneliness, hard work and scarcity of food take their toll on Yatina's spirit. By the time the 16-year-old Eilert, Nesha and Adseriana's middle son and Yatina's nephew, arrives at their homestead in 1893, he finds Yatina in a destitute state, depressed and with a broken spirit. Huam approaches here a problem that afflicted many Norwegian women in the Midwest during the period after, of early settlement, namely depression and other mental health problems. The transition from smaller communities in Norway with tight networks of neighbors and family to living in remote, isolated places combined with the hardship that building a homestead from scratch implied proved in many cases to be too much for many women settlers. According to historical records, among them collected by Odd Luvol in his book, um, Norwegians on the Prairie, um, melancholia and depression were common problems among the Scandinavians and disproportionately so for women. Likewise, Ule Erölvog gives a poignant account in his Giants in the Earth of Beret Per Hansa's wife and her mental breakdown on the prairie due to the hardships of settler life in the Midwest. Yatina's strategy for escaping her melancholia is to join her husband and on his hunting and trapping trips when the occasion allows for it between her duties as a mother and a farm wife. Trivial life on their isolated homestead does not suit her adventurous and restless nature and through stubborn and will and tenacity, she succeeds in convincing Ule to take her with him on his hunting trips. Ule understands that this is a line of flight that she needs in order to survive their harsh life on the prairie. 
Katina remains unconventional and daring throughout her whole life, pushing boundaries for what is acceptable behavior for a woman in America. Edward Huem admits to knowing very little about Yatina before starting to write, but recounts that he once visited her grave in Roslyn, South Dakota. Accordingly, he creatively constructs Yatina as a feisty and manifested semi-fictional character by using fragments of information from historical records, letters, other fictional works, and above all, his own imagination. It is evident that the author empathizes with her and her fate one that she shared with thousands of other Norwegian women who emigrated to America. The study of the last character, Eilid Knutsen Nesha, or Eilid Knutsson, as he called himself in America, the other main character in the four volume Falmi saga, in addition to Yatina, will be pursued in a longer version of my reading of Holmes no novels to be published in the upcoming book in Nordic Travel. Suffice it to say at this point that Eilid traveled across the Atlantic at a tender age, alone and full of hopes for a new life in America. He later made his way from South Dakota to various Norwegian communities in the Midwest, working odd jobs before he eventually settled in Donata, Ontario in Canada, where he married a Swedish woman, Martha Lysing. And this is their home in Donata. They had eight children and led a fairly happy life as farmers before Martha died in childbirth when Eilid was 50 years old. Eilid remarried this time to a Norwegian woman who later died of cancer, leaving him a widower for the second time at the age of 72. He ended up in a basement apartment in Chicago, Illinois, where he shared a house with his two unmarried daughters. Eilid experienced spiritual struggles throughout his whole life, vacillating between believing in God as a young man, to doubting his existence in early adulthood, to becoming born again Christian and a vital member of the layman Lutheran church in his community as a mature adult. He never saw his parents again after he left at 16, but made a journey by airplane back to Norway in the 1950s to visit his younger brother Anton Edvard. Eilid died in 1959 sad and disillusioned, doubting the grace of God at the age of 83. Eilis' journey represents no exception to the common experience of most immigrants from Norway to America during this period in history. In this sense, his life in the New World is exemplary for Norwegian men who emigrated to North America and who experienced both extreme hardships and moments of happiness. The lives of Eilid, Yatin, and all the other family members that we count encounter in the course of these four volumes are transformed, mainly through the author's masterful command of the Neo-Norwegian language and the aesthetic resources that he manages to mobilize in the process. By creatively reworking historical records, archival material, interviews, letters, and family anecdotes, Huem creates a powerful fictional account of characters that have the capacity to enthrall the reader through 1700 pages. That is quite a feast. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ellen. That was really fascinating and I definitely agree this is really a feast <laughs> if you manage to do that. Um, I think what you also um, took up is something which we haven't discussed so much and this is the, uh, the relations between uh, reality and fiction and how to read uh, travel narratives. And, um, and this is, of course, a very big question in uh, discussing travel narratives, especially. So uh, thank you for that. Um, are there any questions? Yes, Jakob, please. <laughs> uh, Ellen, thank you for uh, a splendid talk. Uh, um, it is so rich and uh, it is linked to our topic in so many different ways that that um, blend, it, blend into each other. Um, if you were to define, uh, this may be impossible, but I just want to ask you, um, is it possible to give a kind of working definition of uh, what I took to be one of your key terms? That is, you used the phrase a hybrid, uh, a hybrid text. Um, thinking of our topic, travel literature, um, how would you define um, 
perhaps I missed something, but how would you define or give a working definition of, of that concept? What is a hybrid text in, in, you, in your talk? Well, I would probably say that, that uh, um, most texts are hybrid texts mm. in some way or another. And perhaps especially so for fictional texts, um, because they draw on so many different other texts in order to, to uh, become uh, a work of art. Yes. And, uh, and of course, travel literature has, uh, you know, ever since the Odyssey, uh, been a part of the, uh, the, the main uh, genres that we have in, in world literature. Uh, uh, so it's, you know, the, the whole, um, uh, the hybridity between travel literature and, and literature is, is, is as old as, as uh, the whole tradition. And yeah. yet um, uh, there is an element of travel literature uh, that I would assume has the ambition of, of being factual in a way that, um, that literary works does not. Even Wirklichkeitsliteratur is fictional. Knoskor's uh, novels are also are fiction, even though he purports to, to talk about uh, real events in life uh, of known people, including himself, or perhaps above all himself. So um, there is, of course, a difference, you know, the, the, the historical discourses, uh, and uh, for anybody who's worked on, on new historicism knows also the whole question of, of, of uh, genres and aesthetic devices used in writing historical texts. And, and uh, there are uh, a number of problems involved in even the kind of literature, uh, the, the kind of text that purports to be factual and historically correct. Mm -hmm. How you convey this is fraught with difficulties. So uh, hybridity, I think, is sort of almost a condition of possibility for most texts. And yet uh, there is um, uh, an impetus to try in travel literature also to, to ground these texts in actual places in, in, in space and time. And uh, so I don't know, you probably have a better uh, uh, you 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 have you're you're better equipped to come up with a definition than I. No am. no no yeah. no no. So <laughs> I, I, I just I, I, I but it, uh, am I right in 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 um, sort of inferring from your talk that um, um how should I put this uh, one one sort of thrust thrust of your argument seemed to me to be that that um, considered as a as a, as a whole the, this very Im impressive book series is uh, that its its interest its quality its its lasting importance is is aided by or furthered by the elements of fiction that you 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 regard this and the way who am uses fiction as an asset as a as a contribution to his overall achievement yes yeah. Yes, absolutely. I, and he's, I, I he, but he says that it's even integral to his ambition of creating true representations. Yes. Mm. And so, uh, in in some sense, uh, um, fictional text might be better help for him than many historical or or texts on fauna and and and, and so on. Yes. Mm, th thank you.
Can I just add a comment? Because uh, what I think is also so fascinating about uh, these chronicles uh, and the sources uh, in this respect is that uh, especially letters from America were usually in the 19th century published in, in journals and magazines. Mm -hmm. And people would sit in the villages and read them. So it's in a way they be, this kind of distinction between uh, the, the private and the public was dissolved. And um, uh, taking part in this discourse uh, has already a long tradition. So when he writes them and these chronicles, he probably can also draw on this tradition yes. that people have discussed the private, uh, um, um, private affairs of, uh, of people who wrote, uh, sent their letters from America for a pretty long time. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Um, is there any other question? If not, then I would like to thank you again so much, Ellen, for a very inspiring talk. Yeah, welcome back to our last session for today. Anyway, I'm very happy now uh, to introduce uh, Janike Eskosa. Uh, Janike is a scholar in comparative literature at the University of Oslo. Her academic interests are book history, literature, national identity, children's literature, travel writing, with a focus on Canada and the Arctic. Janike has received His Majesty's The King's Gold Medal in 2018 for her dissertation on English Canadian travel writing in the 1950s. And she's currently working on transnational aspects in children's magazines in Denmark, Norway. But what she is going to talk about today is um, something different. And it's about Leonie Donnet's uh, Voyage d'une femme au Spitzberg and its Norwegian translation. The screen is yours, Janike. Thank you so much, Rike. So, uh, in the summer of 1839, Leonie Donet traveled from Paris through the Netherlands, Belgium, Germany, Denmark, Sweden, and Norway before she joined the La Recherche expedition um, on its route from Hammerfest in northern Norway to Spitsbergen Svalbard. And very briefly, this was a French admiralty expedition whose destination was the North Atlantic and the Scandinavian islands, so including the Faroe Islands. Uh, Spitsbergen in Iceland, and it was a part of a um, series of scientific expeditions led by Joseph uh, Paul Gaimard, involving French, but also Swedish, Danish, and Norwegian participants, and among them, um, Sami minister and botanist Lars Levle Stadius. Uh, and at the time of her journey, Leodine, Leonie Donnet was 18, turning 19, as she went as the only woman on this expedition together with her fiancé, François-Auguste Viard, and they boarded the corvette way up at Hummel Fest, partly due to the fact that women were not allowed on board ships owned by the French government at the time. And I guess, Biar, some of you probably already know, and maybe you've seen his work in Nordnorsk Kunstmuseum in Tromsø. And he um, had been a painter at the court of Louis Philip I, and he was one of the um, officials, official painters of this expedition. Now, Donnet. Uh, in the 1850s, Donet became known as an author, journalist, and playwright. And she was then by, inf by then infamous uh, for her extramarital relationship with v Victor Hugo. And when they were literally caught in the act in 1845, it caused a great scandal. And she was arrested for adultery and also served a two month uh, prison sentence. Whereas he, of course, invoking his immunity as a recently appointed member as, uh, of the Chamber of Peers was let go. So, uh, this was just a little bit of gossip to wake you up in the afternoon. Um, but what I really want to talk about here is Donet's, um, one of her first uh, texts, namely her account of her journey to Spitsbergen, entitled Voyage d'une femme au Spitsberg, or in English, A uh, Woman's Journey to Spitsbergen. And this is considered among the very first descriptions of Northern Scandinavian Spitsbergen by a woman. And it was first published uh, as a feuilleton in the literary magazine Revue du Paris in 1852, and then in book form in 1854. And it was a great success and was reissued seven times until 1885, and then 
in two critical editions in the 1990s. Now, as the title of my paper suggests, I'm not only concerned with um, Donnet's text in French, but also with its Norwegian translation. Um, it was translated by Geneviève Ulochen and published in 18, uh, six, uh, sorry, 1968 under the title Emparisirinnes reise gjennom Norge til Spitsbergen, Amlo 1838. And so in this way, I have two projects in this paper. I want to say something about Donet's um, uh, travel account and about her, um, her, the form of it and also her self-representation. But I also want to say something about the Norwegian translation. And by taking a closer look uh, on some of the um, changes that have been made between original, original text and translation, I hope to draw attention to how uh, her representation of the Nordic region is slightly altered and what the implications might be. But I will return to this later. Now, uh, in many ways, Donet's rendering of the Nordic region shares many similarities with other 19th century accounts. For one, she very much emphasizes her meetings with the Sami, we've already seen in other accounts, uh, and she describes them as peaceful, hardworking citizens, but in the main, her portrayal is condescending and, um, and unfavorable. So in this, it's quite similar to the majority of the um, of the descriptions from the same time. In her renderings of the landscape, and I will show you a quote, but I won't go into it. But as you can see, she invokes the imagery from romanticism. And her representation of Spitsbergen, for example, is characterized by a poetic and romantic tone in which she compares the landscapes to ruins and cities of ice with spires and pyramids. And she refers to the Magdalena Fjord as magical and beautiful, but also apocalyptic. So a place that awakens the feeling of both horror and admiration. And this intensity seems to um, increase the further north she goes. And she even states that her story will become more and more interesting as she moves to the higher latitudes of what she refers to as old Europe. Now, a couple of comments on the epistolary form of the account because they're relevant to Donet's role in the text. Now, the travel account is composed as nine letters addressed to a Monsieur Léon de Boinet, based in New York, and which she goes on to address as her dear brother. Uh, and this was Donet's half-brother. He was 12 years old at the time that she undertook her journey and had been dead for three years when the, um, public, when the text was published. Uh, and scholars have really claimed that this brother is first and foremost a pretext for Donet, um, and it makes, um, makes it possible for her to make use of a certain style, but also to disarm the reader regarding the fact that she is a young and still unmarried woman traveling. And indeed, this claim is strengthened by the fact that there are very few references to him in the text, and he kind of disappears um, later on in the account altogether. Now, of course, letters have been central to the travel writing genre from early on and also have been influenced by the epistolary form of 18th century novels. And an earlier well-known example that I think Ulrike mentioned earlier would, of course, be Wollstonecraft's text from 1796, which possibly influenced Donet's account. And in Donet's text, um, the epistolary form helps establish a more personal and subjective outlook that surely makes a contrast to the scientific reports that would be published in the wake of this expedition. And they create the impression of a certain immediacy and intimacy between the author narr narrator and the brother, and then by implication, the reader. So another effect of this epistolary form is how it underlines Donet not merely as a traveler, but also as a traveler who writes. And besides referring to her letter writing, she also reflects upon her writing more generally on her abilities and inabilities to render her experience in the North. And she's also very explicit on her intention to be truthful, to kind of pick up on the, the discussion we had after Edwin's paper. Now, uh, scholar Wendy Mercer links these formal aspects to Donet's role on the expedition, and she considers the fact that the account is written as letters to Donet's role as a tourist, uh, someone being on holiday. And, uh, but I would argue that Donet could not perhaps have written her account in any other way, except for a diary form, for instance, because it is indeed through these more personal narrative forms that women have gained access to the travel writing genre and also to public debate more generally. So the discourse of the kind of objective scientific report was not available for women in the same way. 
But that said, and now I'm uh, referring to Marmier, who also Alexandre mentioned in his paper, um, French author and traveler Marmier was the official reporter of the expedition, and he also published his account from this journey as letters. Uh, and these were also, in fact, translated into Norwegian uh, in 1997. But these letters are, however, addressed to another author, Antoine de Latour, and they are of a less domestic and familiar character than those by Donet. And of course, as the expedition's official reporter, there would be other obligations to keep his letters more in tune with the scientific objective discourse. And as for Donet, she's very um, conscious of her exceptional position as a woman on the expedition. And she makes use of this fact to un underline the extraordinary character of both her journey and of her account. And when at the Magdalena Fjord, she dwells on the fact that her name, a woman's name, is engraved together with the names of the male expedition members on a stone. And later, when she refers, returns to Hammerfest from Spitsbergen, she writes, and I quote, If you could have seen me, you would perhaps have found me quite pale and meager, but you would, I hope, have some esteem for a woman who has completed a journey, which no other woman has made, and which no other woman, I dare say, will ever make again. End of quote. So the circumstances of Donet joining this expedition in the first place is accounted for in her first letter, where she expresses a desire to go north in a conversation with Gaimard, so the leader of the expedition. And Gaimard replies that if she managed to persuade her husband, so the painter Biard, to come along on the expedition as one of the landscape painters, he will make sure that she can join too. And this diverges from the more general understanding that it was King Louis Philippe himself who wanted to be on the expedition, or also the, um, if it was Gaimard who approached Donet. But what's important is that in Donet's account, she's the one kind of in charge of her own and her fiancé's participation. But at the same time, it is obvious that her possibility of joining this expedition is exa exactly as Biard's future wife. But this is underplayed throughout the account, and she, I think she only mentioned his, his name, or uh, she refers to uh, Montmari four times. This might also be because the marriage is about to be annulled the, the um, year after. Um, now, Donet does not have any part uh, in the scientific or artistic work during this expedition, and she is more than anything perhaps a passenger or, as Mercer argues, a tourist. She enjoys herself and she has no tasks aboard the ship. But there are many instances I find where she assumes um, an authority that exceeds that of the mere tourist. For example, she makes several references to earlier explorations in the region. And she also mentioned the expedition's scientific research, although she admits that she does not understand each and every detail of it. Moreover, she goes to places that are far from touristy, such as she visits the mines in Kofjord and later in Falun, reflecting upon how it is for the men working down there in the darkness, these martyrs of poverty, as she puts it. Um, she often shows an interest in an awareness of domestic life uh, in both the urban areas and the rural regions. And she shows a keen eye for detail in the descriptions of the houses she visits. Um, she gives concentric descriptions of the rooms in which she stays and the meals she has served. And she also gives elaborate descriptions of the women she sees. And in this, she is often merciless. And the women of Christiana, for example, and I quote, Donne finds to be rather pretty or better, rather graceful, despite two beauty defects that are significant to the experts, the rotten teeth and the very big ears. But one sees beautiful complexion, beautiful hair and figures that for Northern figures are elegant. Moreover, she is very attentive to clothing, um, that Sami clothing, but also to women's clothing uh, more generally, such as when she describes the woolen dresses and the, the head decorations and jewelries of the women of Ysta, Sweden. And this might be partly due to the fact that she dresses in men's clothing aboard the ship, but she also writes about fashion later in her career. Now, it is tempting to see this interest as a consequence, uh, consequence of Donet being um, a woman um, and a, a woman traveler, but as we know, these are not unitary categories. And I would like out to point out that many of the topics that we find in Donet's account is recognizable in those by male travelers. So like Noné, for example, Marmier, who we heard about earlier, gives a detailed and praising description of the Semi-Cradle, the Kumse. 
And also as for female beauty, Nansen, for example, has very strong opinions on this topic when he meets Greenlandic women on his expedition in 1888-89. So, but even so, I think we should have in mind that kind of the role of the role that beauty played was quite different for a young woman in the mid 19th century. And she's even warned before she goes that going on this expedition will make you ugly. So by implication, this will ruin your future prospects. So just to sum up this part, um, I would say that even though Donet's position on the expedition and in the Nordic region is surely that of an outsider being a female passenger, her account also draws on ideas that are typical of northern, um, nor northern Nordic journeys more uh, generally, and subjects such as beauty and clothing and, and things belonging more to the domestic sphere we are not absent from the, from the accounts by male travelers. Okay, I will make a shift to the second project of this um, paper, namely the Norwegian translation of Donet's text. In Paris and Rydnes Reise gjennom Norge til Spitsbergen anno 1838, or in English, A Parisian's Journey Through Norway to Spitsbergen in the year 1838. And I will briefly comment on some of the variations we find here. And this is really an attempt to highlight questions related to translation and travel writing studies more generally. And of course, translation studies has certainly been of importance to question regarding travel and regarding how travel literature changes when it appears in new languages, new historical and cultural contexts, and for new readerships. And this is specifically the case with the Norwegian translation of Donet's text, which kind of brings back for a home audience um, a culture. Um, and I think, as we also talked about earlier, that part of our ambition with this conference is to bring critical perspectives on the Nordic region. And if my paper can do this in any way, I think that the issue of translation must play into it. Now, I realize the obvious drawback of doing this through a third language, English. Um, and Donet's text has not been translated into English fully, but parts of it were translated and published in the British Bentley's Miscellany and the New York-based Eclectic Magazine, both in 1858. So all translations in this paper then are um, uh, mine and from the French and probably with some errors. I'm sure Alexandre have, can correct me um, on several occasions. But I think that despite these disadvantages, I still believe that the aspect of translation is important for a discussion of how representations of the Nordic region uh, travel themselves and change. So some of the variations we find in Norwegian translation are plain errors, such as the year uh, 1838, the year was 1839. But more important, I find, are the seemingly more intended alterations. Um, so one obvious difference is the change from fam to parisirinne and the inclusion, of course, of reise and the or journey through Norway. And the explicit mention of Norway here is most likely to make the book more relevant and attractive to a Norwegian market. And the change to parisirinne keeps the emphasis on the author's gender, but it also contributes to a greater emphasis on, the, on Donet's urbanity and thus highlighting the contrast between the traveler and the exotic and rural places she visits, although she does also visit several cities on her way north. And evidently, Spitsbergen is kept as the focus in both titles. And we see further variations in the very beginning of the translation, such as in the omission of the reference to Monsieur Boinet and to My Dear Brother. And the preface to the Norwegian translation notes that the book is written as letters to Donet's brother, but he's not part of the main text. So there's another kind of undermining of the domestic and familiar in Donet's account. Another major difference is that the Norwegian translation has been significantly shortened. So the numbers of letters have been reduced from nine to eight, and the first letter has been cut by approximately three quarters. So this means that 22 of 28 pages have been cut. So this leaves out Donet's description of her journey to the Netherlands and Germany, large parts of her journey to Hamburg, her stay in Rotterdam, and her arrival in Denmark. So both begin on board the, um, the ship Willem de Erste on his way to Hamburg, but in the Norwegian uh, translation then it quickly jumps to her arrival in Christiania in the next letter. The letter on 
Finland is omitted altogether. And in this, so in the same way as the inclusion of Norway that we saw in the title, the shortening of the original main text serves a similar purpose, a more coherent focus on Norway. And we see actually the same mechanisms in the Finnish translation from 1977, which renders only the parts of the journey between Hammerfest, Taparanda, and Torino. So these omissions have the obvious effect that it narrows down the geographical focus of Dunne's journey and what constitutes the Nordic region. The majority of the arrivals and departures are simply left out, which means that her movement to, between, and within the Nordic countries are often played down, except for those who are extraordinarily fatiguing, such as her journey across Finnmark Sida or the sailing to Spitsbergen. So in this way, the very form and structure of her journey is altered, playing down the getting around and liminal spaces in between, instead highlighting the having arrived the more ruptures and less continuity in the way her movements are represented in the Norwegian translation. Now, I could have shown you many changes in this translation, not only in structure, but also syntax and wording, which often have an impact on the meaning or at least slightly different associations. But I want to show you just one uh, final example before I finish. It can be taken from Donet's visit to the mines in Thalun, which I mentioned earlier where miners or mineurs in the French original is translate, translated into treller in Norwegian, so slaves, um, which is, of course, a much more loaded word and which also strengths, strengthens the social commentary, not, men, not only on the Nordic region, but also on Europe more generally. So just to conclude, uh, these changes in the translation have an effect on the representation of the traveler herself of her travel experience and of the Nordic region. And they testify to how choices of what is translated and how may tell us something about the Nordic perspectives on what the Nordic is and what the Nordic should be. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Janneke. This uh, was really very fascinating and it also introduced uh, the topic of translation, which we have so far I have uh, only briefly commented on, but I think which most of us working on material in different languages um, have to deal with. And, um, but before I go on, I just would like to know, are there any questions? Mm -hmm. Celia, there's a question from you. Yeah, thank you for that interesting uh, paper, uh, Janneke. Um, um, you mentioned, this is just a detail, and you mentioned that, that Leonid dressed in men's clothing aboard the ship, right? And I am uh, interested in cross-dressing on polar expeditions, and I thought that this was, a, a, in some ways, an early uh, a parallel to this. So does she dress in women's clothing on other stretches of the journey? And does she reflect on this uh, in the text? I read portions of it, but I, I cannot remember myself. <laughs> uh, thank you, Celia. I actually thought about you and about your work on cross-dressing when I read this. And um, I, I had to, um, uh, I said only aboard the ship, but that's not true. She also wears it when there she's at Spitsbergen and there's this wonderful, um, um, wonderful passage where she, um, where they, they're having fun. So they're kind of um, sliding down these uh, great um, slopes. And then she reflects upon how wearing men's clothing is very liberating and that something she could never do um, wearing female clothes. And she's also quite, um, uh, quite um, conscious about how her wearing male clothes also um, functions in order to not set her so much apart from the male uh, crew um, because she overhears these men talking that it's bad luck you know to bring a woman on board the ship so she feels that it's kind of a um, um, safety in wearing male clothes also um, but I think um, She's also quite, um, when she comes back to civilization, she's also very happy that she can now wear her female clothes again. So there's this ambiguity regarding her, what it allows her to do and also what she feels comfortable in as a woman. Thank you, I have to reread it now. Yes, you have to. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, are there any other questions? 
Um, maybe I then I can have a question. Um, and uh, first of all, I think uh, I don't know, Yannicke, uh, uh, whether you know Fran Francesco Negri's um, text in Italian, and which was also partly translated into Norwegian and uh, not in other languages. And I think this could actually be very, very good uh, comparison if you, if you want to look at that. Because there you sh it, it's quite obvious that the parts that are translated into Norwegian um, also should um, uh, show a, a, a particular uh, image of what Norwegians are like. And some parts are left out so it had a lot to do, this translation has a lot to do with self-representation by Norwegians themselves. But this was just a comment. Um, the other thing which I wanted, for me, as someone working uh, on uh, cultural representations of the, of the aurora, uh, Borealis, um, the recherche, La Recherche exped, expedition is just so important because it uh, really shaped uh, the ideas of what the aurora looked like before one could take pictures of it and actually go there and see it for themselves. So um, I wonder, maybe this is <laughs> too far-fetched that you can answer this, but I wonder um, whether her images, her pictures, uh, her ideas uh, of the aurora also had an impact because I've never read about that. I only read about the official um, report and the influence the images from the official report had on the on, on the images of the aurora. Uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure if I'm able to answer it, but from uh, what I remember, she, I, my impression is that her representations of landscapes more generally, and also then the aurora uh, as a phenomena, draws on um, kind of the um, the language of previous descriptions. Mm -hmm. um, so I, and, and it's more in, like, it's, it's not scientific. It's much more sensory, you know, with the, the sight. Um, but it's, it's um, more than in tune with the rom kind of romantic language and also the more the, the sub sublimity of it more than anything. So I'm not sure, and that's also a good question. I'm not sure like to what extent this account actually influenced anything and what kind of impact of course it had an impact because it was very popular but in what way it had an impact kind of on the discourse on the north and the discourse on the arctic that i don't know um yeah well it, it says something that um i haven't read about it even yeah exactly and also just the fact that it's um, translated then in 1968. Mm -hmm. I would like to know which and I would love to find more about that, but I haven't found any kind of background to why why this specific text was translated at this specific time. Um, but it might be kind of a project to bring out um, forgotten females <laughs> uh, in the late 60s, early 70s. Interesting. Thank you. Are there any other questions? No, then, um, uh, then I would like to say thank you so much again, Janike, for this really fascinating presentation. And uh, then uh, we go on to our last speaker for today. And uh, this is Jakob Lothar. Uh, Jakob um, is uh, in uh, a school in English literature at the University of Oslo and his research spans over a wide field of interests, uh, modernism, late 19th century literature, narrative theory and analysis, fiction and film, ethics in literature and film, post-colonial studies, Holocaust studies and memory studies, but also the interplay of Nordic and European modernisms. And Jakob has also published extensively in all these fields. And um, I just would like to mention uh, the latest book he has edited and which actually was presented here, here at the Academy a few weeks ago on research and human rights. Jakob, the digital floor is yours. 
Thank you, Ulrika. I want to start by showing you this um, photo. Um, it shows a variant of seagull or half hest flying towards Norton Schildbreen on Svalbard, which has been mentioned already today. Most famous for his discovery of the Northeast Passage in 1878 to 80, Nils Adolf Erik Norton Schild was a Finnish Swedish researcher and explorer who in the 1860s led several expeditions to Svalbard. If the glacier that bears his name represents his lasting fascination with Svalbard and with the Arctic, I'm inclined to consider the half hest that flies towards the glacier um, and, and, and thus in one sense towards Nordenskjöld as a symbolic representation of the attraction of the Arctic. An attraction not just prompted by a wish to explore the unknown, but also by a sense of freedom, speed and independence. Seen thus, there is a link between this photograph and the papers given by Ulrike and Janneke earlier today. Um, there is also a link between this photo and the traveller I'm going to discuss in this paper, the British explorer Cecil Slingsby's uh, trips to Norway and his book, based on his book, Norway, the Northern Playground or the Northern Utopia. This title, um, The Northern Playground, is uh, with a photo of uh, Luen Van, which is from Norfjord, the fjord I come from in Norway, the most beautiful fjord in Norway, um, is linked to um, a study or the, 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 the phrase uh, Northern Utopia, which is used in a fine study by Peter Fjorgesund, who is a speaker at our conference, and Ruth Symes, the Northern Utopia, British Perceptions of Norway in the 19th century. As Fjorgesund and Symes show, in the 19th century, the ancient filial tie between Britain and Norway was rediscovered by a tourist industry, which took thousands of travelers across the North Sea to see the fjords and wonders um, and mountains in Western Norway in particular. Slingsby was one of these tourists, and yet he wasn't. Or perhaps rather, as an explorer, he wasn't just, but more than a tourist. While he was able to observe and enjoy Norway from a, a position of privilege, financial cost doesn't appear to have been an issue for him. He consistently sought to travel further and higher than any other British tourist who visited Norway during the period discussed by Fjorgesund and Symes. If his many travels to and in Norway form a diverse and multifaceted pattern, his attitude to travel is similarly complex. I argue that Slingsby's use of epigraphs in his main work about his travels to Norway, that is, Norway, the Northern Playground, sketches of climbing and mountain exploration in Norway between 1872 and 1903, simultaneously suggests and reveals a significant aspect of this complexity. Moreover, and this is the second part of my argument, I suggest that the range of epigraphs provides an interesting illustration of and a kind of implied reflection on the interplay of factual and fictional travel accounts. This is a photograph of Slingsby. And this is a map of Jotunfjellene, which I was very fortunate to, um, to, to find and buy um, um, at a flea market in Oslo some years ago. Uh, interestingly, it is mentioned, date or named Jotunfjellene, and it is from 1879 which is four years after Slingsby's ascent of Store Skogostel's tent, and just a few years before the term Jotun Heimen was introduced by the Norwegian poet and traveller, uh, Osmund Olofsson Vinje. 
Now, I move on to uh, my um, working definition of travel writing. Uh, Tim Young's um, has suggested the following definition, um, proceeding from what he calls a guiding principle that, quote, travel writing consists of predominantly factual first person prose accounts of travels that have been undertaken by the author narrator, unquote. Um, I'm not going to comment on this term author narrator, which is indicative of precisely this kind of interplay or complexity, which Ellen also commented on uh, between faction and fiction, or what happened and what perhaps did not happen, or at least not the experiences of what happened can vary, as we all know. Um, what's interesting about the term travel literature is that in Norwegian, race literature is actually more inclusive than literature because in common Norwegian usage, I think even today, it tends to refer um, accounts that would comply with or agree with uh, Young's definition. Uh, although Young's and Peter Holm, uh, who co-edited the, the Cambridge Companion to Travel Writing, argued that an exclusive definition of travel writing is required. For other critics like me, this is complicated by the existence of a close overlap between fictional and factual accounts of travel. Moreover, as Barbara Kort has, I think, convincingly argued, quote, as far as the text and its narrative techniques are concerned, there appears to be no essential distinction between the travel account proper and more fictional forms of travel um, literature. It doesn't follow that um, both forms can't be different, but it follows that especially when read and studied as narratives constituted by a range of techniques, there isn't the, not only a strong similarity, but also a productive interplay between the two forms. I think one of the constituent um, elements of travel liter literature's appeal, um, uh, simply put, one reason why it's so enormously popular is precisely this uh, productive interplay. Now, in this paper, I'm going to suggest and briefly argue that Slingsby's epigraphs in this book, Norway, the Northern Playground, provide an intriguing example of this interplay, while the narrative records his travels to Norway and Jotunheim in particular. The epigraphs link Slingsby's travel narrative to descriptions of and reflections on aspects of travel in poetry, essays, and a drama, including um, Shakespeare. Now, what is an epigraph? This is just one definition out of many. Um, interestingly, I, I can't go into this, but one interesting aspect of this definition, or its, its first part, is um, a link to, to some of the problems uh, uh, discussed by um, Kirsty uh, in her paper on, on Eikemo. Uh, the Oxford English Dictionary, uh, quote, an, an inscription typically found on a building, sculpture, coin, or other material object, semicolon, also a quotation or phrase placed at the beginning of a book, chapter, poem, etc. It is primarily the second part of the definition that applies to my following discussion. Now, I have to be selective here. So I start by sharing with you some reflections on the opening of chapter four, uh, sorry, chapter five. And I'll just read out the epigraph uh, loud. Über allen Gipfeln ist Ruh. In allen Wimpfeln spürest du kaum einen Hauch. Die Vögelein schweigen im Walde, warte nur, Walde, ruhest du. Auch. Um, this, as you know, is arguably one of the most famous poems in German uh, literature. 
uh, might even say perhaps the German language. Uh, so why does Slingsby use it as an epigraph here? Um, what is striking about it, I think, compared to the narrative of his book, is uh, the epigraph's lack of movement. The atmosphere of this poem, this uh, wonderful poem by Goethe, considered often as an example of the German Die Deutsche Klassik, is um, very peaceful. The speaker is at rest. He or she is perhaps soon falling asleep. Illustrative of the range of epigraphs that Slinks incorporates into his travel narrative, this short poem is notable for the way in which it freezes a moment in time, while at the same time suggesting that one important reason why the moment is so precious is the affinity or harmony between the speaker and nature. Whether the speaker has traveled to this place in order to experience the moment, the poem doesn't say, but it is one possible implication. A further implication is, or could be, that the combination of balde and oest suggests not just sleep, but perhaps also death. In other words, what I'm suggesting here is that whether it is intentional or not, I'm not, I'm not really all that interested in, in, in intention here, um, the effect of the inclusion of this poem at the beginning of chapter five is to halt or slow down the narrative uh, in a way that creates a certain tension, I would say a productive tension between uh, the poem and the following account of uh, Slingsby's ascent to of Galhöpigen. Okay. Then I would like to move to my next quotation, which is from chapter seven. This is um, where Slingsby um, gives an account or relates his, uh, um, the part of his journey or exploration, um, climbing Glitter Tint, uh, the second highest mountain in Norway. Uh, and that is um, uh, a, a little later. Uh, this is 1875. Okay. Um, here he uses two epigraphs and I'm going to comment on the first one which is um, from a, a poem by Matthew Arnold. Ye are bound for the mountains, ah with you let me go, where your cold distant barrier, the vast range of snow through the loose clouds lifts dimly, its white peaks in the air, how deep is the stillness, ah would I were there. Here, the atmosphere is quite different from Goethe's poem. While the speaker in Goethe's poem is in nature, an integral part of nature, the I in this poem by Arnold seems that serves as the, as the epigraph here is longing for the mountains. He or she is not in the mountains, but longing for them appropriating the terms used by Friedrich Schiller in his essay on naive and uh, sentimental poetry, we could perhaps say that while the attitude to nature in Goethe's poem is naive in a positive sense, um, that of the speaker in Arnold's poem is more sentimental. Here it is the distance, there is a distance between the speaker and nature and perhaps as a consequence of this distance, a longing for it. This kind of distance is a modern, perhaps even modernist feature of this, this epigraph. It may even, there may even be an element of melancholia, melancholy in it. And this feature, um, if, we, if you agree with my interpretation so far, is, is stronger and more significant in what is perhaps Arnold's most famous poem, Dover Beach. Now this epigraph then is a striking example of the way in which three different aspects of an epigraph may interact. First, it introduces the reader to the following chapter, obviously. Second, on a second reading of the travel narrative, 
Uh, it provides a response to and reflection on that chapter. Third, for the reader who knows other poems by Arnold, for example, Dover Beach, it may be imbued with an element of intertextuality that further strengthens its uh, literary dimension. Okay, now if you look at the main text here, you, may, you can see that um, um, uh, Slingsby uh, writes about his sister who accompanied him on this trip and she then became, his sister became the first woman to climb a glitter tent. Um, and then there's a link, I would argue, between uh, this uh, lady, um, his sister, um, via Therese Bertau, who in 1894 became the first woman to climb Store Skagerstil's tent, um, to um, uh, um, a contemporary or modern explorer like Cecilia Skog, who has climbed the highest mountains on all five continents. Now, the ascent of Skagerstil's tent um, is, um, um, that was Slingsby's main climbing sort of achievement in Norway and what really made him um, fam very famous uh, uh, in, in a Norwegian context too. Um, the quotation here is interestingly from uh, the Irish poet Thomas Moore and it is a bit different or quite different from those I've read or presented to you so far. Um, when time who steals our years away shall steal our pleasures too, the memory of the past will stay and half our joys renew. Here, memory is highlighted in a new way. Um, it is or becomes um, probably perhaps because his, his, his memory of this particular climbing feat, the ascent and this ascent to descent from Sture Skagerstil's tent is what he remembers best, his, his main or the, the, the key sort of the center of his memory of his, all his climbing expeditions um, during his or over the course of 25 years when he visited Norway almost every uh, summer. Um, okay, now uh, because I don't have much time, I want to move to the end of, this is a photo which is actually in the book of Sture Skagerstil's tent, uh, I want to move to, to, to the end of, of his narrative. Um, and here I'm not going to discuss the quotation from Longfellow, I'm going to move to a different or comment on a different aspect of the epigraphs because interestingly um, increasingly as the narrative progresses Slingsby not only mentions photographs from different uh, sorry epigraphs from different sources but also starts quoting from different texts in inside or as part of the main narrative and I'm just going to give you one or two examples. Um, this is from uh, the penultimate page of the book. Um, no man, however callous he may be by nature, can be much amongst the high mountains without gaining strength of character as well as physical strength. King David knew this when he wrote in Psalm uh, 121, I lift mine eyes unto the hills, from whence cometh my help. Go then to the mountains for all that is worth having in life. Learn again in the mountain solitudes the lessons which you learned on your mother's knee and perhaps have forgotten in the bustle of this noisy world. Now, what I would like to briefly emphasize here is that while King David goes on to link the hills directly to the Lord, Slingsby continues by emphasizing the significance of the mountains themselves. Although there is an element of proposopeia or personification in this description of the mountains, it's kept in check by, quote, the mountain solitudes. Thus, the mountain's unique quality is paradoxical. 
it can further the tabula's ethos or character because it is not human. As a non-human entity, as an unspoilt part of nature, the mountains can give the traveller something precious that not only enriches the traveller's visit to the mountains, but provides him or her an experience of lasting value. Um, okay, um, now this is the, this is the end of, of, of the book, uh, of the travel narrative. Um, as you can see, it ends with a quotation. However, this quotation, which is a kind of epigraph, even though it is part of the main text, is in contrast to the epigraphs earlier on, it is not identified. The name of the author is not given. So it makes a difference then whether you happen to know the author or you don't. Here too, the language is religious. Slingsby's use of worship introduces the key words and the agency uh, of the quotation. Great cathedrals of the earth. Here, as in the quotation from the Psalms, the emphasis is on the sublime mountains rather than God. They are, as it, it seems, endowed with a quality, the mountains are endowed with a quality of their own. Yet it is, of course, possible to consider the mountains as God's creation. Um, although the author of the quotation is not identified, his name actually occurs after several epigraphs earlier on in the narrative. From my perspective, the most interesting of these quotations, or uh, epigraphs, sorry, is um, that at the beginning of chapter 21. A fool always wants to shorten space and kill time. A wise man wants to lengthen both. So this is a quotation um, or an epigraph by Ruskin. And the last sentence, which I've just commented on, is also from Ruskin. There is a significant link between this epigraph and the end um, of the book. In order to discover the significance of the mountains, you need to travel slowly. In order to appreciate their unique quality, you need to lengthen time. While Slingsby traveled to Norway 21 times, Ruskin visited Venice 11 times. If that city made a strong impression on Ruskin, so did the orbs, which he had to traverse in order to reach Italy. He was strongly influenced by the painter William Turner, and in the summers of 1845, 58 and 69, Ruskin retracted the route through the orbs that Turner had taken before him. Now, I'm of course not claiming that the leader that the reader needs to be able to identify Ruskin as the author of this ending in order to adequately respond to it. But if you do, then um, uh, it adds something to your um, experience. Um, um, Ulrika, how much time have I got left? Actually, Ulrika? No. No time, really. No time. I should end. I should end now. I'm sorry. I've got too much material. Uh, this is just a, a quotation from Stevenson, which gives the title of my paper, To Travel Hopefully is a Better Thing Than to Arrive. So I'll just move to my conclusion. Um, these are just elements of something that I hope to um, change or elaborate um, into a paper. Uh, my main point, in a way, is to say that uh, Slingsby's use of epigraphs um, do s does something to his travel narrative. Um, it makes it more interesting, at least to me. Um, it shows how an account that is, in one way, strictly you know, based on what he actually did as an explorer and mountaineer, is enriched by epigraphs from other kinds of texts. This establishes a tension between what he actually did and what he has perhaps been prompted to reflect on and think about as a result of his travels. And similarly, 
the epigraphs then also enrich the reader's experience of the travel narrative. And finally, because I have to end, um, one um, element of Slingsby's um, account that I think is more, more significant now than it was a um, hundred years ago is uh, his respect um, for nature and the environment and also for the Norwegians who live in this environment. And this gives his account a distinctly ecological dimension, which is um, important and um, um, in one sense makes his uh, account more relevant uh, today than it was, not least with a view to climate change. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Jakob. Um, there were so many interesting details you told us about, and I think also this kind of looking at um, epigraphs uh, from that way, at least for me as an historian, this is something which I really needed it that you make me aware of that. So thank you for that also personally. But as, what I think you also showed beautifully um, was that travel is also um, and has been for a long time also part of a common space of experience and especially probably in the 19th century when more and more people started reading other travel accounts that more and more people could afford uh, to travel. And I also thought about the um, epigraphs you mentioned um, by Goethe, uh, Matthew Arnold, Longfellow. I could find exactly these ones also in my main sources, which are German language sources, travel narratives. So this also shows me, you know, thinking about John Ari's tourist gaze, that um, there was some kind of uh, common discourse across uh, language barriers and cultural barriers. Mm, yes, yeah. I, I agree. Thank, thank you. Mm. Um, I, um, are there any questions? Yes, uh, you are. Yes, thank, thank you for a, a wonderful paper. Um, I'm, of course, especially interested in, in this problem of epigraphs as, as, as the borders of texts. But oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. But, but, but uh, um, I was also wondering damn i've forgotten my question sorry i'll, I'll get back to it so <laughs> i just have to think epigraphs, to epigraphs are definitely borders uh, of different kinds and um, um there, is, there is one problem here which i uh, which i uh, uh, can't really i'm not sure how to deal with and this is um, the link to, to, to with intertextuality which is something i'm always a bit suspicious of while at the same time finding finding it very very interesting um, uh, what i'm saying is that um, i think it's important that the epigraphs um, um, at the beginning of each chapter one or two um, there isn't a single chapter without epi an epigraph I think it is important that uh, the name of the author is is given. Um, um, the closing sentence, which I read out loud to you, which is from uh, Ruskin, is not identified. So probably most readers, uh, perhaps e even including myself, would not know that this is Ruskin um, without actually making some investigations. Now, I, I think it is still effective, but uh, there is always some, I'm, I'm a bit hesitant when it comes to sort of using methods in a text that, that uh, um, presuppose or take at least some level of, of competence um, as, as required or, or from from the reader, if if you see what what I mean, uh, I think this is uh, this is uh, not exactly a problem, but it is one dimension of of epigraphs, and and, and especially if they aren't identified, all all kinds of intertextuality. Uh, mm -hmm. I think uh, it's important to state that that uh, uh, 
an adequate reading doesn't necessarily have to be a very sophisticated reading if if you if you understand what what i mean mm -hmm. but now i remember the question because that reminds me of what the question was and that was yeah. um first of all they they bear witness to to slings his, uh, let's say, erudition or his cultured background. Yes, in a sense. absolutely, yes. But they also frame the text for the reader in a way which makes clear that he, I mean, Mike, I suppose this is a question, is he making a claim, first of all, that the travel writing is a, is, is a, is, can be associated with literature by using these these uh, quotes from famous poets and authors uh, to make that connection, to associate himself with that. And also, is he um, trying to make a claim, I think, I, uh, that, that climbing in itself is a cultural activity um, because it brings with it many shall we say, philosophical associations. I'm also thinking we had a very strong tradition within British climbing, at least, that all famous routes have names. Well, all routes in, on British yeah, yes. uh, rock surfaces have names, and they're given traditionally by the first person to send the route. And there are many, many, many hundreds of thousands of these routes in Britain, of course, and very many of them have literary references in them. Or philosophical references in them. Um, yes, I mean, yes. I saw that Andrew Newby that, actually, that's, that's actually very... in, in the chat here had made reference to a, a, <laughs> a famous climb on Ben Nevis called Slingsby's Chimney. Yes, um, uh, which is a it detects reference to the to the history of climbing itself. But many other routes can be you know they can be names from the Lord of the Rings or whatever. Yes, that's very, very interesting, uh, Johan. Um, incidentally, um, Slingsby was very pleased to, to have one of the glaciers uh, uh, close to Store Skagerstedstend uh, named after him, the Slingsby Glacier, Slingsby Breen, which is now unfortunately much smaller than it was because when Slingsby you know, climbed the mountain because of climate change. But anyway, uh, I, I, I'm not sure to what extent, he, well, I think in one sense he's making this kind of claim, but at the very least he is suggesting that for him, I mean, in his, as part of his experience, uh, literature, uh, including these uh, epigraphs, these quotations from literary texts, uh, essays, uh, poems, drama, um, including, as I mentioned, at least two dramas by Shakespeare. Uh, he is suggesting that these, uh, this, uh, this kind of resource, this kind of literary resource, knowledge of these texts, um, are, are not only linked to his, to his uh, travels, his, his uh, um, explorations, but also enrich them and and make them distinct and and significant in in a, in a in a in a different way in a, in a particular way and by implication i think then he is also suggesting that that uh, for him um there is no marked uh, no market no sharp divide or distinction between uh, what um, what um, youngs would call a, a proper um, factual travel account whatever that might be and uh, accounts that are also linked or enriched, linked to enriched by um, um, more fictional um, texts or literary texts. Um, so I, I find uh, also with a view to, to, to our approach to this conference and, and our discussions today, I, I, I find this kind of travel uh, writing very, very interesting and, and in some ways uh, original yeah thank you thank you and we have uh, two more questions and i would suggest that we take both of them and uh, um, even though we are a bit late already um, one is uh, by peter uh, fugesund and the other one um, is i think alastair also had a question if I, yeah then uh, peter uh, okay, thank you. Um, it was just not really a question, but rather a comment. So isn't isn't it true to 
uh, shouldn't we sort of see this almost as a kind of expectation that when Slingsby writes, he's a mountaineer, he comes from a background of Oxbridge men who are all well read and so on. It's, isn't it almost expected that a, a man like him should be throwing around literary quotes uh, and epigrams like this? So I, I, I sort of, he, he comes from the whole Leslie Stephen and, and Oxbridge tradition. So this seems in a sense perfectly natural and almost obvious, doesn't it? Well, perhaps it does, Peter. That is, that is. Uh, I'm not going to argue. Um, um, I think that is that is probably true. I, I'm, my my sort of approach here has, has not necessarily been, or not mainly been, uh, contextual in that particular sense. I'm I'm more interested in the effects of these epigraphs in the narrative as I read it um, today, um, and. Um, um, I think I think the narrative is uh, becomes more interesting, more complex, um, uh, in one sense even more relevant because of the the epigraphs. Uh, um, probably the Oxbridge reader or a kind of colleague is is um, perhaps as close as we, as you could come to a, a kind of implied reader for for Slingsby, um, and yet. Uh, you might even take that point further, arguing that or suggesting that if that's the case or when that's the case, um, then it is um, perhaps even more, becomes even more interesting um, and striking how, how relevant and, and uh, um, much of this um, discourse, to use that word, can, can be to, a, to a Norwegian reader like myself um, um, more than a century later. Does that make any kind of sense to you? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And then we have our last question uh, for today, and this is Alastair, please. Yes, hello. Uh, I'm by no means a, a literary scholar. So, so as, a, as a, um, an atmosphere and ocean scientist, it's fascinating to, to me to, to listen to all the, the very interesting presentations. Um, my my comment is that uh, I've been reading the work of Nan Shepherd, who uh, who's, uh -huh. uh, whose um, book *The Living Mountain* is is uh, a, a, a very much philosophical tract on the Scottish Cairngorms, but she also has a poem on a Norwegian mountain uh, called Falketin. A oh, Falketin. That's that's very very interesting. It's a, in, a very interesting comment then, anyway. Uh, Falketind um, was the first uh, difficult mountain to be climbed in Norway, at least that has been recorded. And this happened in 1820. Um, so there's a 200 year anniversary this year. And um, uh, the ascent of Falketind was uh, inspirational for Slingsby in his endeavors um, 40, 50 years, uh, you know, 40, 50 years later. Um, and it is actually mentioned in, um, in, in his book too. Keilhau, I think, was the name of, of uh, it was a student from Oslo who climbed, and his friend who climbed, two friends climbed Falketind, yeah. 1820. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, and then uh, uh, thank you very much, um, Jakob, uh, and uh, for this uh, really interesting paper. And thank you all for um, participating, being there, asking questions just following.